So this is a lecture video over the chemistry that would be important in uh, helping understand the physiology in this anatomy and physiology course. The title of the chapter is Chemistry Comes Alive. And we'll start with uh, trying to answer a question, why might it matter, especially if you're going into a health professions. Knowing the chemistry and biochemistry is going to help uh, determine for the health professional the most effective way to treat dehydration and fluid loss for patients who suffer from those conditions. The body itself and the cells that are, are within there are made up of many chemicals. Because of that, we need to understand uh, uh, some of that basic chemistry. And in fact, uh, the, the physiology, we cannot understand the physiology without understanding what's going on at the cellular level. And inside the cellular level, where we have movement, uh, digestion taking place, muscles contracting, for example, in the heart to uh, pump blood through the body or uh, nervous impulses, uh, being able to understand those requires uh, understanding the chemistry uh, and the physiology that occurs at that level. Uh, we're going to break down our chapter into two uh, into two parts. Uh, part one will cover basic chemistry, which you might get in a general chemistry course, and then uh, the chemistry that occurs within cells is the biochemistry, and that would be part two. Uh, so looking at section one, which is titled Matter and Energy, our learning outcomes are, uh, the first outcome is for the student to be able to differentiate between matter and energy and between potential energy and kinetic energy and to describe the major forms of energy. So what is matter? Matter is a vocabulary word uh, for, for this chapter and it is anything that has mass and occupies space. And what mass is? Mass is just a, a measure of the amount of matter uh, in, a, in an object. Uh, as far as matter goes, it can be seen. It's something that we can smell or even feel. When it comes to talking about weight. Weight is another quantity. It's, it's different than mass. Mass is how much stuff or material you have in an object. Weight is, is the effects or the force due to gravity. So in fact, when we are trying to calculate weight, uh, weight is going to be equal to mass times the force of gravity. And so that force of gravity, or that, uh, or not the force of gravity, but the acceleration due to gravity. Gravity on, on Earth is much greater because Earth is more massive. So if we were to take an object, and that same object, and it's going to have the same mass on the moon. Well, the moon's a smaller object, so it's going to have a less uh, uh, pull or a lesser acceleration uh, caused by, the, by gravi the gravitational attraction. And so we would have a smaller quantity for the weight because there's less force there. So uh, the states of matter, uh, matter can exist actually in, in more than, uh, it's recognized more than three states, but the states that are relevant to our study here include solid, uh, liquid, and gas. And uh, for a solid, a solid's gonna have a definite shape and volume, much like the ice cube we see here uh, in our diagram there on the right. And uh, no matter where we move that ice cube, it'll still have the same shape and same volume. And then if we were to melt the ice and it becomes water, that water can be poured into different containers and would take the shape of that container. So the shape is changeable, but the volume would still be the same. So if we had 500 milliliters of water, you still got 500 milliliters of water. Uh, and then if we continue to heat the, the water, it'll eventually boil and evaporate away, it'll boil away. And, and here now the, the water is in gas form, the water molecules, and uh, and uh, those particles, those uh, the, the vaporized water would take the shape of any container and the volume can change. And so how do we go from a solid where the particles are locked in place to the particles being able to move but still attracted to each other and then completely free of each other? In order to do that, you would need to add uh, heat, add heat energy. And that's going to increase the speed of the particles till eventually they break free. And so what would we do if we're going to go from a gas to a liquid? Well, we'd have to do the opposite and lose heat or remove heat from the substance, in this case, water. So now we're going to move on to energy. And energy uh, is another definition. It is defined as the cap capacity or ability to do work uh, or put matter into motion. So uh, energy, though, is not going to have any mass and it does not take up space. So it uh, does not take up space there. And uh, when we think about when we're doing work on an object, basically we are changing its motion. And when we change its motion, we're changing its, uh, its energy, its energy state. When an object is moving, it has kinetic energy. So if we apply a force to that object, 
then we can speed it up and its kinetic energy increases. So the more work we do, the more energy we have to use uh, to change that object's motion. Now there's uh, two basic uh, forms that energy can occur in. We have kinetic and potential. And so kinetic energy basically is the energy of motion, energy in action, and then potential is basically stored energy. Uh, like if I were to stretch out a rubber band, well that stretched rubber band now can, if we let it go and release it, it can, it can do work on things uh, and it can change the motion of objects. Now we can transform energy from potential to kinetic and indeed we can also change kinetic to potential uh, energy or back and forth so energy can change uh, its form. Okay? Uh, and there's, so there's actually different kinds, specific kinds of energy. Uh, there's chemical energy, for example, in gasoline or food, and this kind of energy is going to be stored in the chemical bonds of the atoms that make up those substances. Uh, and then we have electrical energy, and electrical energy is a result from the movement of charged particles, uh, like negative or positive particles. Negative particles would be like uh, uh, electrons. Electrons would have a negative charge to them. And then we have mechanical energy, which is directly involved in moving matter. Uh, so in terms of a mechanical system, uh, any a system that has moving parts uh, and is moving relative to other objects, there's a certain amount of energy associated with that movement. Uh, and then we have radiant elect or electrical magnetic uh, energy. And uh, there, uh, the, uh, the energy there travels in waves, electromagnetic waves. This will be the energy given off by stars like the sun. Uh, or our artificial lights that we produce uh, and uh, light up with electricity. Uh, and this kind of electromagnetic radiation can take the form of, uh, take, take different forms and, and one we're capable of actually sensing, which is visible light. Heat uh, actually is probably they're referring to infrared radiation, which we cannot see, but it's still electromagnetic. Ultraviolet or UV. A light we can't see, but that's the one that can give you sunburns and um, can lead to skin cancer. And x-rays, which are even more energetic, uh, and all of them are of the same form. They're made of electric, electric and magnetic uh, fields and travels through waves and can travel through space. So, as I said, we can convert energy from one form to another. Uh, and uh, the example there are given as like when we turn on a lamp, we're converting the electrical energy coming through the wires and we're turning on, uh, we're using that to light up uh, a light bulb. Now the energy conversion is really not efficient. Uh, if you've ever uh, touched a bulb that's been on for a while, a light bulb, even the new LEDs are going to give off a lot of heat. So really they're more like heat bulbs because most of the energy is going to be lost as heat. So that's something to remember is that when we convert from one form of energy to another, the it's never 100% efficient. It's inefficient. We're always going to lose energy from the system in the form of heat, uh, which is really not usable by us. It just radiates back out into space. So uh, I found this example here of energy uh, that is locked up in the bonds of, uh, of molecules. And uh, in this case, coal would be our energy source. And when they burn the coal, uh, in a combustion, which is the coal uh, reacting with oxygen at high temperature and it ignites and gives off heat, they're going to use that to uh, boil water and then the steam is used to turn tur turbines, creating mechanical energy uh, that then moves the generators that produce electric current. Now, at this location, right at the power plant, the efficiency is only 35% or 0.35, and that means 65% is lost as heat. Now, that 35% energy then travels through this power line of the original energy, and of that 35%, only 90% uh, makes it to the house uh, down at the other end of the power line. This is because as those electron currents are moving through the wires, heat is being given off, so we have some loss of heat there. And then when you enter the house and that current goes through the bulb, uh, that remaining energy that's, th that, that's there, only 4% of that is used to produce light and the rest of it is heat that's what i was saying these are really heat bulbs because in this case here in this example 96 percent of the energy that entered the bulb is given off as heat overall the efficiency from burning the coal the energy that was originally locked in the in the coal 
to the energy used to give light is only 1.3% efficient. And they show the calculation down here. They're just multiplying the uh, ratios. Uh, 0 0.35, 0 0.9 times 0 0.04 gives us a total of 0 0.013, which is 1.3% efficient. So looking at uh, chemical energy uh, here, the sample question, chemical energy is A, is it the movement of charged particles? B, energy stored in the bonds between atoms? C, a form of potential energy? Or D, both B and C? And then, uh, which of the following is not an example of matter? Is it A, blood plasma? Is it B, the air we breathe? Is it C, a bone from the hand? Or is it D, energy? So section two covers atoms and elements and our learning objectives for this section include the, to define the chemical element and list four elements that form the bulk of body matter. And then define atom and then list subatomic particles and describe their relative mass, masses, charges, and positions in the atom. And then to define atomic number, atomic mass, atomic weight, isotope, and radioisotope. So um, all matter is going to be composed of elements. And an element or elements are substances that cannot be broken down into simpler substances by ordinary chemical methods. So if you have oxygen, it's pure oxygen, you can't break it down any further. And if you do, then it's not going to be oxygen anymore. So ordinary chemical methods or chemical reactions, oxygen will always remain oxygen regardless of any processes that take place. There's going to be four elements that make up 96% of the mass of your body. All you got to do here is remember uh, one for carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. It's not really in the actual order of their relative amounts, but overall they make up 96% of the mass of your body. Uh, there are going to be nine elements, nine other elements that make up 3.9% of the mass of your body. And then 11 elements that are found in really, really small amounts, only uh, one one hundredth of a percent or, le or less than one one hundredth of a percent, 0.01%. Uh, the periodic table is going to be a list of all the known elements. And I put a picture of the periodic table there in the bottom right. And as you can see, there is a reason why it's called periodic table. I'll probably try to make a tutorial that uh, that uh, shows why it's called periodic but overall they're they're listed in order of atomic numbers so atomic number one is hydrogen then all the way across helium going back to the second row lithium beryllium boron carbon at number six uh, right there and so on and so they're arranged in order of increasing size which really is an increasing number of protons in the nucleus is how they're arranged so basically hydrogen would have one proton, helium two protons, lithium three protons, etc. So now uh, all elements are going to be made up of atoms. So at, at, an atom itself basically is a fundamental block or unit of an element. Uh, so this is a unique building block for an element. It's the smallest particle of an element and with, and still has the properties of that element. So let's say you, you had a sample of carbon and you kept breaking it down further and further. Eventually you're going to get down to one little particle that's still carbon. It's a carbon atom. It still behaves like any other carbon atom or as carbon as a substance. Uh, and these uh, atoms are what gives each element its particular physical and chemical properties. This is the structure of the atom for an element that gives it that, uh, um, that behavior, both physical and chemical. So uh, using carbon again as an example, any carbon at, given carbon atom is going to have the same overall structure roughly and then that structure is what gives it its properties. An oxygen atom, for example, would have a different structure and that would give it different uh, properties. So the atomic symbol is gonna be a one or two letter uh, chemical shorthand uh, for each element. And if it's gonna be a big uh, uh, or one, one letter like oxygen, then it would be O uh, or C for carbon. Uh, but if it's a two element, uh, a two symbol element, then the second letter must be lowercase, like CO in the case of the metal cobalt. So you got to be careful there. If you're trying to represent cobalt and you put CO, now you're talking about a compound that's made of carbon and oxygen instead. So this would be carbon monoxide, which is a toxic gas. Um, now some of them are going to uh, be named or, or the symbol is going to be basically based on the first letter 
O for oxygen, C for carbon. Uh, but in the case of sodium, uh, for example, Na, the sodium is going to get its name from the Latin name. Uh, so the old name for sodium is natrium. Uh, we can't use S because S has already been used for sulfur. And for potassium, phosphorus already uses P, so we're going to use callium, which is the old name for, uh, uh, for potassium. And then I had uh, it's kind of a little joke here. You can see I've spelled out bacon here, but that includes uh, barium, which is atomic number 56, cobalt, which is atomic number 27, and then nitrogen, which is atomic number 7. Those atomic numbers right here tell you the number of protons in the nucleus. Here's your symbol. This uh, The decimal number is going to be the average weight or the atomic mass or weight of uh, atomic weight of the element. Uh, and that's what you find in each of the boxes on the periodic table. So looking at uh, the most abundant elements in our bodies, making up 96, roughly 96% of the weight of our body. Uh, oxygen symbol O is 65% of our mass and it's uh, a component of both organic and inorganic uh, molecules. For inorganic molecule, for example, would be water. Organic molecules are gonna have carbon in them. Um, and as a gas, this oxygen is, we inhale the oxygen so it can be used uh, to generate energy within our cells. So that oxygen is gonna be used to produce uh, our energy for the cell, which is ATP. And then there's carbon, which makes up 18.5% of the mass. And carbon is what defines organic molecules. So molecules with carbon, um, for the most part, are gonna be organic. And they include carbohydrates, lipids, uh, proteins and nucleic acids. Lipids is a, is a general term for fats and oils. And then hydrogen is uh, symbol H and its mass relative uh, body, relative amount by, by body mass is 9.5%. Uh, and it is a big component of organic molecules and it can occur as a, as a charged particle or a charged ion called a proton. So if a hydrogen uh, atom loses its negative electron, then it becomes positively charged. And overall, we call that a hydrogen ion or proton. And this one's a big one in determining pH, which is the relative amount of acid uh, that we have in our body fluids. Then nitrogen is 3.2% of our body mass. Atomic symbol is N for that one. And it's a big component of proteins and nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are our genetic material like DNA. And then we have uh, elements found in lesser amounts, here's calcium, uh, which is 1.5% uh, of the mass of our body. You've probably heard of calcium in bones and teeth. It does help make our bones and teeth hard. Uh, as an ion, it forms a plus two charge, so it's a positive uh, calcium ion. Uh, and this ion, calcium, uh, is necessary for muscle contraction and uh, for nerves. Uh, nerve impulses and for blood clotting when you get a cut. So this is very, the calcium is stored in the bones. So not only does it help the bones uh, become hardened, but it also uh, gets released into the, into the fluids so that uh, muscles, nerves, and, and uh, blood clotting can function properly. Then we have phosphorus, which is about 1% of our body mass. It's a component of the calcium salts that are deposited. So the calcium we find in our bones is actually in a form called calcium phosphate which is found in bones and teeth. It's also uh, present in uh, the phosphate, is also present in nucleic acids. Phos phosphorus is a component there. ATP, which is our uh, energy currency within the cell, and uh, phospholipids, which make up membranes, uh, cell membranes. And then there's potassium, which is uh, atomic symbol K, is about 0.4% of our body mass. Uh, as an ion in our fluid, it's the potassium ion has a plus uh, plus charge on there. Uh, so it's a major uh, positive ion, which we call cations um, in cells, and it's necessary for proper nerve function and muscle function. Again, so we'll, we'll go over the physiology of that later uh, once we get to muscles and, and nerves. And then sulfur, about 0.3% of our mass. So we're going in uh, overall, we're decreasing in the, uh, the percent body mass that these elements make. Um, sulfur is a component of proteins, uh, especially muscle proteins, and the reason that so one of the amino, uh, two of the amino acids that make up our proteins have sulfur in there, so that's where the sulfur, sulfur comes from. And then we have uh, sodium, which is about 0.2%, and sodium is also 
found as an ion in our fluid. It's a positive cation, uh, Na+. Uh, and uh, it's found in those extracellular fluids. And it's important for the water balance, the amount of salt and sodium we have in our fluids. Uh, helps us balance water. It's also another important cation in nerve and muscle functioning. Again, we'll learn at those when we get to that part in the, uh, those chapters on muscle and nerve function. And then chlorine uh, is 0.2% of our mass, and it's going to be in the form of a negative, not positive, but a negative ion called the chloride ion. Uh, and it's a very, very abundant anion. Anion is another name for negative ion on extracellular foods. And then we have magnesium, about 0.1%. Uh, it can be present in bone, but it's also going to be found as a cofactor in a number of metabolic reactions. So cofactors are are going to be uh, substances that uh, help uh, enzymes work properly and enzymes run your metabolism. And then iodine uh, is about 0.1%, and this one's needed to produce thyroid hormones. So for proper thyroid functioning, we're going to need some iodine in our diet. And then iron is found in blood. It makes up the protein called hemoglobin, or is found in hemoglobin, uh, which is used to transport oxygen. And then iron is also important for the functioning of some enzymes. And then we have the trace elements. Uh, these uh, usually are some of the extra minerals that you might find in uh, not only in our food, but if you take a multivitamin, you read the package, you'll see some of these elements listed in there. And these guys are going to be found in very, very small amounts. All of them combined are going to make up less than 0.01% of our mass. They include chromium, cobalt, copper, fluorine, mang manganese, and then molybdenum, uh, molybdenum uh, selenium, silicon, tin, vanadium, and zinc. All of those are going to be important. And many of them are uh, those uh, uh, cofactors that help uh, our enzymes function properly. Uh, so that our metabolism can run uh, properly. Uh, so looking at the structure of atoms, atoms have three subatomic particles. And so we're going to be using uh, a P with a plus charge to symbolize protons. They have a positive charge and they have a mass of uh, one AMU, one atomic mass unit. So this is a very, very small mass. And uh, these masses are measured in very, very uh, uh, really cool machines called mass spectrometers. Uh, if you want to look up how one of those worked. Uh, and then uh, we just don't have time to talk about how they figure these things out. And then the neutron, we're going to symbolize the N with a zero there, uh, the superscript. And uh, these are also going to have about the same mass as a proton, 1 AMU, but their charge is neutral. And then electrons, which carry a negative charge. And these guys are going to have virtually no weight. So we're going to say zero AMU for those. They do have mass, it's just that their mass is about 2,000 times smaller, or 1 2,000th the mass of a proton or a neutron. Okay, so 1 2,000th of that mass. By the way, these guys right here, the protons and the neutrons, are going to be found in the nucleus. And the electrons are found outside the nucleus in the electron cloud. And so uh, if we're going to have a neutral atom, uh, the number of neutrons does not matter since the neutron in the nucleus with the protons, that neutron is, um, is going to be um, it's neutral, right? But the proton has a positive charge. So we're going to need the same amount of, of protons and electrons outside to balance. So if you have a nucleus that has three protons, and let's say that it has three neutrons, and that's in the nucleus, then the question is, how many electrons are we gonna need outside of there? So uh, the answer would be three electrons. But we're also that a number of positives and negative charges balance out. So if we do that, then we have an electrically neutral uh, atom. Again, the protons and neutrons are gonna be found in the nucleus in the center, and the electrons are gonna be found outside of the nucleus. An atom is gonna be mostly empty space, so if we were to take something like a quarter, uh, just to give you an idea of just how much empty space there is in an atom. And we put that quarter in the middle of a football field, right in the center, the rest of the stadium would be the electron cloud. So uh, an atom is gonna be mostly empty space. Now there's two ways we can represent uh, an atom. One is the planetary model, which is an outdated uh, model. And then there's the orbital model. Uh, so we're not going to deal with the plan. We're going we're to actually be drawing planetary models because they're easier to represent than the orbital models. Sometimes this planetary model is called the Bohr model. 
and the electrons are treated as if they are in orbit around the nucleus, like the way planets move around the sun. And uh, the orbital model is sometimes called the quantum mechanical model. And uh, in this one, the electrons are are treated as occurring uh, in, in certain spaces around the nucleus, three-dimensional spaces where they're more likely to be found. So they're, it's more like a probability model, but this second model is the more current model and actually fits uh, our observations the way uh, atoms of elements behave. The Bohr model failed well, when testing it against other elements, so it's not the best model, it's not an accurate model. Uh, so the planetary model, again, if we look here, you're going to have electrons in fixed orbits. The red uh, particles are the protons, the yellow are the neutrons. So if we have two positive charged protons in the middle, then we're going to have two electrons moving in an exact path or an orbit. The quantum, uh, the quantum mechanical or the orbital model, the second one listed here, instead of orbits, we're going to call those three-dimensional probable regions or spaces where we find the electrons. And those are going to be called orbitals, not orbits. And we can represent that here with shading. The darker the shading is, the more likely we are to find electrons. And the further you get out, the less and less shading is, all the way out to infinity in the space out there, you're less, less, and less likely to find electrons. These would be the locations where your two electrons would be found in this particular model. And sometimes they refer to that as an electron cloud. And then, uh, so if we look at, uh, like I said, we're going to be using the planetary model or the Bohr model because it's just simpler to draw and good enough for us to understand some of the basic ideas of an atom. And so we have the first three elements uh, and an atom of each one represented with the planetary model here. First three elements, hydrogen has one proton, helium has two, so it's got a bigger nucleus, and then lithium has three. And because we defined a neutral atom as having the same protons and neutrons, we can see that any hydrogen atom would have the same structure, one proton in the nucleus and only one electron in its orbit. Uh, and every one of them would have that structure. And this gives the helium its behavior. The next element, helium, is going to have two protons. And although it has two neutrons, that doesn't affect how many electrons. It's the protons that does. So we have to have two electrons in the orbit there, and every helium atom would have this basic structure, and that gives helium its properties, which are different than any other element. Next bigger one is lithium. In this case, lithium has three protons, and it's got four neutrons, and again, neutrons don't matter. It's the number of protons that's going to determine the number of electrons. In this case, we're going to have three electrons, two in the first orbit, and then we fill that one with two, and then this, the second orbit's going to have one electron. So every lithium atom would have that and then behave as lithium does, both physically and chemically. Uh, properties are going to be the same for all lithium atoms. Well, atomic number then is, uh, let me mention before, uh, as far as how we arrange the elements in a periodic table, it's going to be the number of protons in the nucleus. So all hydrogen, the atomic number would be one. So if we look at hydrogen, in your periodic table, the symbol would be H with a one there. And that one is its atomic number. Helium on the other side of the periodic table would be He and would have two, and that indicates two protons in the nucleus. And then if we came back uh, to the other side again of the periodic table, the uh, very next one is lithium, and that has three protons. Now, one way we can represent lithium, for example, is to write the atomic number as a subscript here. Then we have another definition here called mass number. And mass number is referring to the mass of an individual atom. And individual atoms are going to have a certain number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. So it's going to be equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. And if I gave you an element, uh, say lithium, and in this case, lithium has a mass, uh, an atom, the lithium atom has a mass number of seven. And we know that lithium from the periodic table has an atomic number of three, which means three protons. Then how many neutrons would it have? And all you have to do is solve for that. So the answer there would have to be four because three plus four would be equal to seven. So lithium seven would be, with a mass of seven, would, be, would actually have four protons. I mean, four neutrons. Sorry about that. So we would write it, uh, we can write that mass number as a superscript. And if we were to represent the structure more fully, then we would write seven 
the mass number as a superscript and three uh, as a subscript. So this is one way to represent uh, the atom structure is to put the symbol and then for a superscript put the mass number as a, a, a superscript and then the atomic number which is the number of protons it's a big idea to remember there as the subscript. There is another way to represent an atom and its structure and that would be to just write the symbol and the mass number individual just like that. And then if you need to, based on the symbol, you go to the periodic table and look up what the atomic number, the number of protons is. So let's say I, I said, well, lithium, this is lithium seven. I just go up to the periodic table, look up lithium and it's number three. So I know that it's three protons, but its mass, which is protons plus neutrons is uh, equal to uh, seven. The atomic weight, which is, is gonna be reported in your periodic table, and this is gonna be the, the decimal number. So for example, if I were to take um, hydrogen. Hydrogen is gonna have an atomic number one and its mass is gonna be one, it's, its atomic weight or atomic mass, we could also call this atomic mass, would be 1.008, roughly. Carbon, which is the sixth element on the periodic table. So there's after hydrogen, helium, then lithium, and then um, beryllium, I think. And then we continue and eventually we get to the sixth element, which is carbon, atomic number six, but its mass is 12.001, okay? But what do those masses represent? Those are the average mass of isotopes for that, uh, uh, for that element. So it's the average mass of a number of all the isotope forms not of an atom, but this should read of an element. So any given element will have certain isotopes. Well, what are isotopes? Well, a while ago I was telling you that what makes an, an, an element an element is based on the number of protons in the nucleus, okay? All carbon atoms of the element carbon would have six protons in the nucleus. All hydrogen would have just one in the nucleus. But what's different here is that the neutrons, the number of neutrons can vary. So every element would have different types of atoms within that element. So there's different forms of carbon, but they're all carbon because they have six protons. So for example, we have carbon, the most common carbon atom in a natural sample of carbon is carbon with a mass of 12, okay? There is a very small amount of carbon 13, which is a bit heavier. Remember, these are the mass numbers. And then there's carbon 14. Remember, this is the mass number. So the mass number, remember, is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So if carbon has a mass, carbon 12 has a mass of 12, and we know the number of protons has to be six, then that means that carbon 12 has six uh, neutrons. There's carbon 13 though, which is a small amount of a carbon sample. And it, would ha it has to have six, that's what makes it carbon. So how many neutrons? This would be having one extra neutron. So it would be seven neutrons and this uh, particular isotope would be a little bit heavier. And then we have carbon 14. Still has to be six, but that, that's what makes it carbon again. But the number of neutrons would be eight now. So this one's even heavier, okay? So uh, these are isotopes of uh, carbon. And down on the bottom of this slide, we have isotopes of hydrogen. And they are all hydrogen because they have one proton in the nucleus. The only thing that varies is the number of neutrons. So that makes the, the isotopes, some isotopes heavier than others. So um, again, isotopes is another term. Uh, and basically they're structural variations or another way of saying different forms of the same element. So these atoms are gonna have the same number of protons. That's why they're all carbon or that's why they're all hydrogen but they're gonna differ in the number of neutrons they contain. Now, all the elements in the periodic table have different isotopes for different forms based on differing number of neutrons. Okay. So here we have hydrogen one, and then we have hydrogen two, and then we have hydrogen three. And the reason why I'm putting a star on hydrogen three and I put a star on hydrogen 14 up here is that their nucleus has gotten too big with the number of neutrons compared to protons that their nucleus is unstable and they are now radioactive uh, isotopes. 
So that's our, our last little topic here is radioisotopes. These are going to be isotopes that uh, they're not stable anymore. The nucleus breaks down uh, or decays or decomposes. Right? And when it does, uh, the atoms may lose uh, certain subatomic particles within the nucleus. And uh, sometimes that loss is going to result in the, in the element changing to different element. Uh, so the isotope is going to become something different. Um, and so uh, as the isotope decays, these subatomic particles are going to be given off uh, and released as energy. And sometimes it, uh, electromagnetic radiation is given off as well. So overall, the particles and radiation that, uh, that comes off is referred to as radioactivity. And there are instruments that can measure this, that can scan for the radiation coming off. So um, I, I have an example here showing carbon-14 at the top. And this is supposed to represent carbon-14, the nucleus of it, with six protons and eight neutrons. And uh, it appears that uh, one of the, the neutrons in there begins to decay, uh, goes through a process, a, a kind of uh, radioactivity called beta decay. And in doing so, some the nucleus breaks down and gives off, the nucleus breaks down and turns into a smaller electron and an antineutrino neutrino is given off. So there's your radiation coming off. Uh, and the product ends up being a proton. That one neutron turns into a proton. So now we're gonna have seven protons in the nucleus and that gives us nitrogen now. So now we've changed to some other element. So this is a nuclear decay, it's a nuclear reaction. Okay? Um, these radioisotopes here can be used as uh, valuable tools in medicine and, and biological research. So uh, the radioisotopes can be valuable for medicine and research and other research. Uh, and the reason for this is we have carbon-14, for example, or any other radioisotope, and they're a part of our normal chemistry, then they become part of that chemistry. And then when they go, go into your body and become parts of molecules in there, if they decay, they can give off radiation, and this radiation can be uh, sensed by machines, so we can do things like uh, 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 imaging and take pictures of tissues. Uh, where those radioisotopes are circulated around in your fluids. Uh, so they can be used to help diagnose diseases. Uh, so they can, for example, uh, inject you with a radioisotope inside your blood vessels and that circulates around and they can take images of your blood vessels, uh, which are softer tissues that x-rays cannot do. Uh, I have another uh, series of, of, of reactions here that are, these, are, these right here are gonna be used to make this radioisotope right here uh, that's a common one used in, uh, in nuclear imaging. It's called techninium, uh, and the isotope number is 99. And, and that, there's a special designation there. So there's a little more complexity here, but you see when they make this radioisotope, they start with an isotope of molyb molybdenum. I always have problems. I probably mispronounced that uh, element, MO98. Uh, and uh, they added a... a, a they force a neutron in on the nucleus, and then it becomes an unstable situation, uh, and, it, and a, a gamma rate is given off. And then uh, this isotope breaks down and then forms the useful uh, radioisotope, which is totally, it's a different element now. And then uh, this radioisotope breaks down again and gives off more radiation, another gamma ray is given off. Uh, and eventually, though, they, they inject a small amount, you're, you're, you end up eliminating this uh, isotope from your body, so it doesn't, it doesn't stay long in your body, it'll be, it'll be excreted with your urinary system. Um, and then, uh, overall, though, too much exposure to any kind of radioactivity can cause damage to your tissues, to your cells, to the molecules. This energy goes off and can break apart DNA molecules and other molecules. And in doing so, uh, we can use this to our advantage, and in some cases, this is very harmful. Uh, so they can use uh, this type of chemical radiation or chemo radiation uh, to help destroy local cancers. So they can uh, concentrate uh, this radioactivity on on uh, cancer tumors and try to kill those cells. And, and also, exposure to these uh, radioisotopes, overexposure, can cause can lead to cancer itself. An example is radon. And radon starts off uh, in the ground uh, under rock as, as, as a uranium isotope that decays. And so 
uh, and then eventually comes up to the surface where humans breathe it in and then in your lungs the isotope breaks down further uh, and the radiation starts to uh, create mutations in your lung tissue that leads to cancer. So it started off as uranium-238, then that, you, that large nucleus, this is the mass number, remember, which is the number of protons and neutrons breaks down, and it forms radon-226, and then radon-226 breaks down to radon-222, and radon is a gas. So this gas begins to seep up through the bedrock and can end up in basements of homes where the humans are there to breathe it in. And then when they breathe it in, the radon-222 is radioactive and it breaks down, giving off radiation directly to your lung tissue. And that will cause lung cancer. Okay, so uh, here's a couple of practice questions and I encourage you to look at some other questions on your own, either in the book or uh, some of the various resources I've given on the weekly activity sheet. So looking at this first question here, the four elements that comprise 96% of living matter are, is it A, carbon, sodium, nitrogen, and oxygen? B, carbon, hydrogen, and sodium, and oxygen? C, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and sodium? Or D, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen? And then this last question here, the element lithium has three protons and four neutrons in its nucleus. So what is its mass number then? Is it A, three? Is it B, four? C7 or D12. So section three uh, covers combining matter and the learning outcomes for this section include for the learner to be able to define molecule and distinguish between compound and mixture uh, and to compare solutions, colloids and suspensions and to apply the concept of a solution concentration to solving problems concentration. Uh, so um, molecules and compounds, uh, these are two terms to, to, that we should understand. Uh, most atoms uh, that are, are for elements can combine chemically with other atoms and when they do so they form either molecules uh, or form molecules and compounds and the molecule uh, is a general term for two or more atoms bonded together, whereas a compound is a little more specific. Here, uh, you're going to have two or more types of atoms bind binding together. For example, we can have two hydrogens binding together to form a molecule of hydrogen, and we can have one carbon and two oxygens combining together um, to form a molecule that looks like this, and that would be carbon dioxide. So both are molecules, but only carbon dioxide is a compound, right? So the notes down here give you an example of C6H12O6. That is a molecule. It's a sugar. Uh, for example, glucose has this formula. That's uh, that's a molecule, but it's also a compound because it has two or more types of, of atoms. Uh, and here are, uh, is a molecule, but not a compound of hydrogen, and then oxygen is also another molecule, but not a compound. Uh, so now looking at mixtures, most matter exists as mixtures, and mixtures are going to be two or more components that are physically mixed. So by physically mixing, they're not chemically reacting, so the uh, components that are being mixed don't uh, change. They stay as they are. Uh, they retain all of their properties. They're just being mixed together. And because of that, we can mix them based on physical processes. No need for a chemical process to, processes to separate them. Uh, so there's three basic types of, uh, of mixtures. There are solutions, colloids, and suspensions. They're summarized here in our diagram here. They give an example of mineral water, which would be water with really uh, with some salts dissolved in there. And here, uh, when you're going to mix uh, uh, components with a, uh, in this in this case, uh, one of the components is going to be a solute, and the other one would be the solvent. And the solute particles here that are going to go in there are going to be very very small. They don't settle out, and if we were to shine light through there, they're so small that the light beams can't be won't be scattered, so the light won't scatter when you see it. You would actually be able to see the beam of light going through there; they would be scattered, so you don't see that. And then a colloid, the solute particles are actually going to be large enough uh, 
they, they can scatter light, but they're not going to settle out. So if you just left this mixture, this colloid sitting there, um, the particles wouldn't settle out. But uh, if you shine a beam of light through there, you can see the beam going through there because some of that light going in this direction here, some of that light, some of the, the light wave uh, 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 rays are going to be uh, reflected towards your eyes. Uh, an example here would be jello. Jello is a mixture of water and large protein uh, particles called gelatin. And so they're small enough to say, stay suspended, but they uh, are, are small enough to stay suspended, but large enough to scatter light. So if we were to shine a light through there, you would see a beam of light. Uh, this is the light would be scattered. And then we have suspensions. And for suspensions, the particles are very large. Uh, they're so large that if you just left uh, the container there, eventually the particles would settle out. And the example they give here is blood. So you get some fresh blood uh, and you leave it there long enough, the blood cells are, are so large that they'll eventually settle out of, of the mixture. And so looking at, we're gonna look at solutions first and, uh, and uh, look at some of their attributes. First of all, they are homogeneous mixtures and homo means the same. And this means that the particles in there are gonna be evenly distributed throughout. There are two main components, the solute, uh, the solvent and the solute. The solute will be the substance that's in the greatest amount. And usually it's gonna be water, especially when we're talking about aqueous solutions. In this case, the aqueous solution is gonna be one in which water uh, is gonna be used to dissolve the other substance. And then the solute, is going to be the the substance that dissolves in the solvent and it's going to be present in smaller amounts an example here is going to be blood sugar uh, the sugar is is a specific kind of sugar found in the blood called glucose it would be the solute and it would be dissolved in the solvent which is the plasma and so if you made tea and you put sugar in there that sugar would be the solute and the water from the tea would be the solvent uh, so uh, if we look at uh, what it means to be a solution and, and some other properties of this the true solution they're going to be transparent for the most part and examples include air like uh, uh, a gas solution of our atmosphere it's a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen and like over 70 percent uh, nitrogen and about 21 percent oxygen so in this case they're two, the two are mixed together and both are gases but the nitrogen would be the solvent because it's in the greatest amount and the oxygen would be the solute in that case. Another example of a true solution would be a salt solution where you've mixed uh, table salt, sodium chloride in water, and then sugar. You can get table sugar, which is called sucrose, and dissolve it in water, like what you might do when you make tea. Now, most solutions that are in the body are going to be true solutions, and they're going to be solutions in which the solutes are either gases, like when oxygen dissolves in the blood, uh, or liquids, or they're or solids dissolved in water. Now, uh, the way gases are transported in blood can be complex, so uh, it's oversimplified to say that the oxygen dissolves in blood. Some does, uh, uh, and some does not. Some is carried by uh, hemoglobin. But either way, you it, within the body, your solutions include uh, water as the basis, uh, the solvent, and the solutes would include gases, liquids, other liquids, and even uh, solids that are going to be dissolved in that environment. Uh, concentrations uh, for these solutions, uh, which is going to be, the concentration is basically a measure of how much of the solute you have per unit of, per unit volume of the solution itself. And so that all of these concentrations are going to be three common ways. And I'm going to uh, provide some examples in the class as well as uh, example calculations and if I have time even a, a tutorial video so be looking out for that but there's three common ways to express concentration but all of them have the same sort of format in that the concentration is going to be the amount of the solute divided by the total volume of the solution once you mix them together. Now, so uh, what is the solution? The solution itself is the combination of both the solute and the solvent together. So if you're going to make a solution, you're going to put whatever amount of solute you need in there 
and you're trying to make a certain volume, now you're going to fill with, if it's, if it's an aqueous solution you, and the uh, water is the, is the solvent, you're going to fill that container now to the desired volume. And so the combination of the two would be your uh, your solution of whatever concentration you made it at. So uh, one common way is to do a percent uh, a solute in solution. And there's two there's two common ones. Depends on whether your solute is a a, a solid or a liquid. If it's a solid, then one is to do a percent mass per unit volume. So in other words, uh, the numerator in the in the calculation here is going to be your mass in grams, and then the volume would be in liters or milliliters. Usually, 100 milliliters would be a convenient way to do that. But if your uh, solute is a liquid, for example, ethanol is an alcohol, it's a liquid, and you can mix it with water. Uh, and when you do, both are liquid, so we might employ instead a volume per volume. So you get a certain amount of volume of the solute, ethanol, and then mix it with the volume of water to make your desired volume and uh, your resulting concentration. Uh, overall, the, the general formula is going to be uh, the percent concentration is going to equal to uh, either the mass or the volume of the of the solute, so the amount of the solute divided by the volume conveniently could be 100 milliliters and then you're going to multiply by 100 to get your percent concentration. Uh, so we can do volume for every 100 milliliters or so. Uh, an example would be 10 parts of, of, uh, of salt for 90 parts of water gives you a 10% solution. This is somewhat misleading. It's not as simple as that, but again, I'll provide a tutorial to clarify that. Uh, and then another way is to do milligrams per deciliter. Now a liter uh, would be, um, we've seen liter containers that have uh, soda or like the soda bottles or the water bottles, or they have liter bottles. So you get a liter, a deciliter, deci means one tenth. So it'd be a tenth of the size of those, of those liter bottles uh, would be the volume. And then the mass would be of the, of the solute would be in milligrams. So uh, that would be the case here. And um, uh, so uh, it says here that the deciliter, this is an error that I keep forgetting to fix. It says deciliter is one hundredth of a liter, it's really one tenth. So it should be one over tenth of a liter. Okay, so that's what a, a deciliter is, which is equal to 0 0.1 liter. That's a deciliter. Okay, so. Um, now, um, uh, an example of a concentration from, uh, uh, from anatomy and physiology would be normal fasting blood sugar. This would be when they, when they do uh, a blood chemistry analysis and they want to know uh, how your blood sugar is doing, they ask you not to eat after midnight so that when you show up in the morning to get your blood uh, tested, they pull that blood out and then they measure the concentration. So normal blood sugar after fasting the, the night before would be about 80 milligrams per deciliter. So every deciliter of your blood will have about 80 uh, milligrams of, of glucose in there. And then there's molarity, and I'm going to provide some examples in class for this. But overall, molarity is another way of doing this, a very common way. It says molarity is the number of moles of solute per liter. Now, moles in, in chemistry is a way of counting particles through mass. It's like when you go to the store and you buy beans, um, you don't count the beans one by one. Instead, you scoop the beans up and you put them on a balance and you measure a certain uh, mass of it. And a certain mass will give you uh, around the same amount of beans each time, uh, approximately, right? Same thing with chemistry. It's impossible to count atoms and molecules, but we can roughly count them through mass. And that's the relationship there. Uh, so it's, it's going to be, uh, again, it's the amount of solute, just as we've seen before, and we're going to divide it by the, the volume in liters of the solvent. So it's the moles of the solute per liter, pretty much. So molarity then is gonna be the number of moles per liter. Okay, so per volume in liters. So that would be in liters. And that's a key there, uh, in liters. And uh, this is your general formula for that. Uh, so I'll, I'll do more on that now. Uh, the slide here goes on to define what a mole is. Uh, it's equal to the molecular weight. So basically what you do is you get a compound like glucose. You're going to add up, you get the masses from the periodic table. 
go to the periodic table, it'll have the symbol and it'll have the atomic number. And then on the bottom, it'll have the mass down here. That's the average mass. That's the mass you get. For example, this was carbon. Carbon would have six, your atomic number would have 12.01. And so that's the mass of, that would be the mass of one atom. So, but we have six in the formula here for glucose. You would need to multiply by six and then add it to the mass of a hydrogen atom multiplied by 12 and then add it to the mass of a oxygen atom multiplied by six and then add up all those masses and that'll give you your total mass. Okay, so that'd be 180 grams. And that would be the mass of one mole of that substance. So in order, in order to get the molecular weight, it's simply the mass in grams of what the total masses are for all of the atoms in the molecule. Now with mole, it's kind of like a dozen, but it's a huge number because mo uh, molecules and atoms are very small. Uh, the mole is actually going to be equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23. Now 10 to the 23 is like 10 to the 9, that's a billion, times 10 to the 9, that's another billion, times like 10 to the 5. There's like 100,000. So it's 9, 18, and 5 more, that's 23. Yeah, so that gives you 23, and then you still have to multiply by 6.02, so a mole of glucose. So if we were to get a mole of glucose, which its mass is 180 grams, if we weighed 180 grams, we would have roughly that many molecules of glucose, right? So, so this is true of any substance. Figure out its mass, its molecular weight, and then get that mass, and that gives you a mole. That number that I just gave you, that large number of 6.02 times 10 to the 23 is referred to as Avogadro's number. Uh, some history there for that, uh, where that number comes from. Now, molarities in the body are usually uh, so small, so uh, they can be as low as 0.0001 uh, moles, uh, molar, uh, and we can express those in uh, millimoles instead. So if we put a little M in front, that would be millimoles. Okay, so. Here are some example concentration problems. Uh, there are one, uh, number one, uh, so this, you might want to consider these and, and see if you can work them out and then come to class so we can look at them more closely uh, with examples. The first question asks to calculate the molarity of sucrose solution made by mixing 2.5 moles of sucrose with 500 milliliters of water. Now they're asking for molarity and you recall from the prior slide there that that molarity uh, there has to be uh, calculated with liters, so we need to change milliliters to liters, so there's a clue there. Our second question here is that for sodium chloride solution, what would happen to the concentration if we double the amount of solute? So the solute in this case is sodium chloride, right? So what happens to the concentration? Now, no numbers are needed, you just need to generalize. Does the volume increase? I mean, not the volume, does the concentration increase or decrease? And if so, by what factor? Does it double? Does it cut, get cut in half? What factor does the uh, solution decrease or increase by? And then I ask the second question, what if instead, instead of us doubling the solute, instead what happens if we if we added enough water to triple the volume? So you would take that same so original sodium chloride solution and then you're going to go pour it in a larger container and then fill it up with enough water where now we have triple the volume. What effect does that have on the concentration? Does it increase the concentration or decrease the concentration of sodium chloride? And by what factor is what you have to look at? The last question, sample question asks, how many grams of glucose, uh, C6H12O6, would be needed to make 250 milliliters of a 1.5 molar glucose solution? Now this one's the most complex of the three questions. And uh, you're really gonna have to think about what the definition of a mole is and how does it relate to mass? and the definition of molarity. So there's going to be two concept equations required to solve this problem. And I give those to you right now. Both of these are needed. The number of moles is related to the mass of that substance you're working with. And you're going to, and that's divided by the molecular weight. Like for example, the weight we added when we added all of the particles together, that gives you the weight of one mole. That's the molar mass. And then I'm asking, well, how many grams? So those are two different quantities. Is how much of it do you need? And what is the overall molecular weight, which is the total of all of the atoms in the, in the molecule? That would give you the number of moles. So in this example, if I had 180 grams of glucose and the molecular weight is 180 grams, well, that's one mole, right? But if I only had 90 grams of it and the molecular weight is still 180, now I have half a mole. So that's kind of the way to think about it. 
And then molarity was, the formula for molarity was given earlier, which is the number of moles, and there's the relationship right there. Number of moles N is the same as this N there, and you would divide it by the volume in liters, right? So these two equations would be required to actually solve this problem. So think about that one, maybe try to solve it, and come to class ready to ask about it. Uh, so looking at colloids now, uh, they're also known as emulsions, and these, instead of being homogeneous, they are going to be heterogeneous uh, mixtures, and that means that the particles are not going to be evenly distributed throughout the mixture. Uh, sometimes with a, with, uh, with a good, uh, uh, good magnification, you'll be able to see the particles separate from the rest of the mixture. Uh, that's not going to be true for a solution. For a solution, the molecules, the particles are so small, you can't see them with a microscope. They're tiny molecules, tiny atoms. Uh, but if this is a case of, say, like milk. Milk is a colloid, and if you were to look at it under a microscope, you will be able to see the little separate droplets of oil. So little collections of oil that are different or heterogeneous from the rest of the milk uh, liquid that's there. Uh, so here, though, those particles are still so small that they're not going to settle out. So you won't sit the milk there, and then the oil settles out. It can't do that. Um, and um, the solutions will tend to look cloudy. So you can see here I've got a picture of of uh, uh, two mixtures. On the left is a solution of sodium chloride solution, and then on the right, we have some sort of colloid where the particles are are large enough that uh, that the mixture looks cloudy. And not only that, you also see another phenomenon here. Uh, we, we see the light being scattered. So there's a beam of light going all the way through both of those in the same direction, but the solution won't scatter the light so you can't see it. So the light continues to go in the same direction it was shining. But when it passes through the colloid, some of the the light rays are going to bounce off the particles and go through your eyes so you can see the beam of light there. That's a phenomenon called the Tyndall effect. And uh, I'm not going to test you on the name of that uh, term. I, I, honestly, I forget if it's two L's or, or, or not, but it's called Tyndall effect. Uh, and um, as far as colloids go, some of these will undergo uh, a sol gel, which stands for a solution to gel transformation. A good example is Jello. When you make Jello like the dessert, besides the fact they put uh, food coloring in there to give it color and then some flavoring to give it a lime or a strawberry or whatever flavor you like, uh, one of the components in there is a protein called gelatin. And the gelatin, when you mix it in the water and the water's warm, it, it, it stays as a liquid um, uh, solution. But then whenever you chill it, it turns into this gel-like. Uh, and this is very similar to the cytosol found within cells. So the cytosol is a component of the cytoplasm. So in cells, we have cytoplasm. And the cytoplasm involves two components. It follows the organelles, which are little tiny structures where metabolisms take place. So you might have a mitochondrion in there in the cell or um, other structures like uh, endoplasmic reticula. And all those are the organelles, uh, and those are those are structures in there. And then you have the liquid part, which is called the cytosol. So the cytosol is a very similar to uh, it's a colloid, and it's, it's a sol gel type uh, situation there. So in the cell, you'd have like the nucleus, where you have your chromosomes, and then the cytoplasm is two components: the liquid part, which is the cytosol, and the organelles, which are the structures in which certain metabolic processes take place. And then we have suspensions, and I just wrote where the, the notes popped up, so let me erase that uh, there. And uh, suspensions are going to be heterogeneous and uh, mixtures, just as colloids were, uh, except they're going to contain large visible solute uh, particles, and these are going to settle out if you rested in there long enough. Example, if you got, uh, like if you got mud or sand and you mixed it in water and you shake it up a whole lot in the in the sand or the mud goes up into the, the dirt goes up into the water column, but then you leave it there on the counter, eventually those particles are heavy enough they settle out. So that's a suspension. Uh, a lot of medications that are in liquid form, for example, are suspension. That's why you have to shake the bottle. Uh, like if you have a bottle of ibuprofen for children, if you look at the bottom before you shake it, you see all these little white particles down there. So those particles are large enough to settle out, and so what you have to do is you have to shake it up so you can mix it thoroughly uh, throughout the entire uh, medicine before you pour it. Blood is another example, which was already mentioned earlier. Those uh, blood cells are large enough they'll settle out. So looking at the differences from the prior section where we mentioned compounds, 
and mixtures. Remember, a compound would be something that, for example, like water. Water is a molecule where your oxygen atom is physically bonded to two hydrogen atoms, right? So this is a molecule uh, and it's a compound in which we've combined two different substances through chemical reaction and actually bonded those particles. That's different than mixing, say, water and sugar, okay, or sucrose. So we mix water and sugar, the water and the sugar remain separate. They don't chemically react, but they mix together into a solution, right? So this would be a mixture and this would be a compound, right? So what are some differences there? The main difference is this is a physical association and this is a chemical association. So here you can separate these by physical means, for example, boiling. We boil the water away and there's the sugar, right? And that was a physical process. But over here, if we're going to separate the oxygen from the hydrogen, we're going to need a chemical reaction to break those bonds there in order to separate them. So there's a big difference there. So let's take a look at these three differences, which you should understand and apply. So unlike compounds, like water here, H2O, a mixture do not involve chemical bonding between the components. So we don't get chemical bonding between the sugar and the water. The mixtures then, because of that, the mixtures can be separated by physical means, like filtering or straining or boiling. Uh, whereas a compound, the only way you can separate it is by a chemical reaction to break those chemical bonds. And then mixtures uh, like our sugar water or our gelatin or our mud and water, those are mixtures. They can either be heterogeneous or homogeneous. Now, the only homogeneous ones are the true solutions, whereas heterogeneous are suspensions and the, uh, the, uh, the colloids, right? Compounds, on the other hand, are always going to be homogeneous. So if I gave you water, which has oxygen and hydrogen, but these are molecules, H2O molecules, every particle in there is h2o so it's homogeneous so i gave you pure water it's a compound it's homogeneous there's nothing else there so now uh, that's the end of this section we're going to look at a couple of example multiple choice questions besides the problems i gave earlier for you to consider you also want to consider these uh, when atoms of two different elements bind together they form is it a compound b mixture c element or d solution and then second question here, which of the following mixtures are homogeneous? Is it A, colloids, B, solutions, C, suspensions, or D, both colloids and suspensions? So this is section four, titled Chemical Bonds. And our learning outcomes for this section include explaining the role of electrons in chemical bonding and in relation to the octet rule and then be able to differentiate among ionic, covalent, and hydrogen bonds. And given two atoms of the same or different element, predict the type of chemical bond likely to form, whether it's ionic or covalent, and to compare and contrast polar and nonpolar compounds. So what are chemical bonds? The chemical bonds are energy relationships between electrons of reacting atoms. These bonds, uh, the chemical bonds are called, are, are not actual physical structures. So they're not like, uh, use an analogy, uh, if you grab one end of a rope and you are an atom and uh, another body, another individual grabs the other side of the rope, there's that physical attraction. These are more energy relationships there. So uh, remember that electrons are the subatomic particles. Uh, that are found in the cloud and they're the ones that are involved in reactions. So when atoms react there, the electrons are, are the ones involved. Uh, they determine, these electrons determine whether a chemical reaction would take place and if so, what type of chemical bond is formed, which is what we'll be examining. Uh, so the electrons are going to be occupying areas around the nucleus and we can call these We've called these before uh, orbitals, but we can also refer to these as shells or electron shells. They're also referred to as energy levels. So when we go back to that uh, <coughs> orbital model, a quantum mechanical model, these uh, electron shells and, and energy levels correspond to those orbitals, energy associated with those orbitals. Now each shell is going to contain electrons that have 
a certain amount of kinetic energy and potential energy. <laughs> so the shells are referred to, again, as energy levels. Depending on the size, an atom can have up to seven electron shells. Uh, and if we went back to the periodic table, those shells actually correspond to the, to the rows on the periodic table. There's seven rows that go across the periodic table. Uh, we'll take a look at the periodic table in a bit. Now these shells, uh, where the electrons occur, can only hold a specific number of electrons. Uh, the shells closest to the nucleus are going to fill first. So the first shell <coughs> can hold a maximum of two electrons. The second shell, again, which corresponds to the second one on the periodic table, can hold only eight electrons. And the third shell can hold a maximum of 18 electrons. But for our purposes and explanation, let's just go ahead and say eight electrons that it can hold. And, uh, just to show you the connection there, if we went to the periodic table here, and we went to the first row here, it's also called periods, these are called periods. We have one proton in the nucleus and that means you have one electron. If we go all the way across to the second element in that row, the atomic number is two, and that would have two protons there and two electrons. Okay? So if you count the number of elements that are in that period, it's two. So that corresponds to holding a maximum number of two electrons. We go back to the second, now the second row, or the second period right here. Uh, as we increase or move along the periodic table, the atomic number is increasing, which means the number of protons is increased. Atomic number of three, three protons, four, four protons for beryllium, five, and six, seven, eight, nine, and then 10 protons in the nucleus. And as we're adding protons, remember that the number of electrons has to be the same. So if we have three protons for lithium. There's three electrons in the cloud outside. If you have eight, like uh, oxygen, uh, protons in the nucleus, then eight electrons. So as we add protons, we're adding electrons as well. So if we have eight, um, <laughs> eight elements in that uh, periodic table in the second row, then that'll help you remember the maximum number of electrons that can fit. Now, if we go to the third period, things start to get a little more complicated. The prior slide said 18, but let, for now, let's just count. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So again, eight more. So what we're talking about here then would be filling in these orbitals and we can draw them as, uh, as orbits, filling in these shells. And so we have our nucleus in the middle where your protons are and as as we start in the first period, that's gonna to correspond to the first energy level, which can hold a maximum of, of uh, eight electrons. So we can draw one, two electrons there, okay? Maximum number, and that's hydrogen and then helium's electron. And then if we, if we move on to lithium, lithium would have three protons and then beryllium, four protons and so on. We start filling in these electrons I'm going to draw them as dots and we want to fill them in in a certain pattern so we put them on one and then go to the opposite side of the of the orbit and then uh, as we start to fill them in remember this one can hold a maximum of eight so as we start increasing the number of protons as we're moving along the periodic table you start adding them in this in this fashion here you put them as far apart as possible then you go back and you pair them up uh, so now we get to a, an element that has uh, six, that's one, two, three, four, five, six protons that would have six electrons arranged this way. Then we go to the next one, seven, which I think is nitrogen. Then it would have one more electron. Now you start pairing them up. So that would be nitrogen. Uh, then you move to oxygen, would have eight total electrons. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight altogether. Uh, and then you continue um, on. So the next element would be uh, after oxygen. Let's see. <clears throat> after oxygen would be uh, fluorine and then neon. <clears throat> so fluorine then would have uh, a total of nine. And so two in the inside, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine electrons. And then when we get to neon, now we're full. So we've got to the end of that second row or second period. Now we go to the third level, which again, 
for our purposes here, can hold a maximum of um, eight valence electrons. So again, you add them in there in that order as you're adding more protons to the nucleus as we're moving along the periodic table. And then you go back and pair them up. And so overall, this is the way your electrons fill in. And remember, you always fill the innermost levels first. So with the smaller elements, you start filling in the inner energy levels, and then you start moving further away. So um, moving on, as you're filling in the, uh, the electrons within their shells, uh, the electrons that are on the outermost shell are going to be referred to the valence electrons. Uh, so you can see uh, I've gone from this periodic table here and I'm sort of going to be ignoring those that are all right here. And we're referencing just the main block elements for now, for our understanding. And that would include those in the, in the first two columns and those in the last six columns, total of eight columns. So we're going to ignore the middle there. The middle is actually refers uh, to certain elements called transition metals. In fact, all the elements that are to the left of, of uh, this line that I'm drawing right here are going to be the metals. Okay, so all of those to the left are metals and the ones that are right here in the middle are transition metals. So we have our metals to the left over here and our non-metals over here. And knowing that's going to help us actually make predictions on what kind of chemical bonds form, whether it's covalent or ionic, but I'll let you know those rules in a bit. Uh, so if we look at the image that I uh, pasted here on the side there, it shows those electrons within the energy levels as we move from left to right. And what we've put out here is the transition metals in the middle, the ones I scribbled out on the prior, prior uh, screen that for the, the more full periodic table. And what we have here is one, two, three, only the first four periods represented. And so you can see we start filling in the electrons, one proton, one electron, two protons, two electrons, and so on. We're going to start to see a pattern fill in here in terms of the number of electrons in the outermost uh, energy level. If we take a look at the first column there, there's only one electron. And then here we have three electrons, but the outermost shell has only one. Same thing on the next, uh, we go to the next period for sodium. Uh, we have more than more than one electron, but the outermost energy level has one electron. The outermost energy level has one electron. Those are the valence electrons. So now we see a pattern here. First column has only one valence electron. The second column, if we fill them in, the pattern shows that we're gonna have two in the outermost shell. And then if we were to continue this, and we move on, let's go ahead and move on. This is uh, uh, the third column in the main group. Uh, uh, and then the fourth column, fifth column, sixth column, seventh column, all of those in the seventh column are gonna have seven valence electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If we went one column before there, where we have oxygen, these are going to have six valence electrons. And then the one before that, five valence electrons. So we have this pattern here, and this explains the behavior. All of the elements in a column are called a family, and all of them behave similarly because they have the same number of valence electrons. For example, and hydrogen is an exception. Hydrogen is kind of odd. But once we go here to these metals here, all of these metals, they have a name called the alkali metals and they all behave the same. They're very, very reactive. That valence electron there is going to be involved in the reactions. They lose it very easily, so they react uh, highly reactive. The second one has two valence electrons, and they, they, they behave similarly. They're pretty reactive, but not as reactive as the first one. And then if we move on and we start getting to the nonmetals, all of these right here, uh, fluorine, chlorine, and all the other ones in those columns are going to have seven valence electrons and they react uh, very easily because they can easily add uh, uh, um, an electron to that valence shell. And so these are highly reactive uh, nonmetals. And then if we get to the last column here, we're going to see something uh, that defines them. These are the noble gases. They don't react well with anyone because they have a full valence shell. Remember that the maximum number you can fit 
in the second shell is eight. The maximum you can fit in the first and only shell for helium is two. For argon, it was eight again, maximum number. So they max out and they're not gonna wanna give up or share or do anything. They have the, uh, they're stable with that, with that full uh, amount of valence electrons. All the other elements do not have a full uh, uh, valence shell electron, so they're going to be reacting now. So that's the key, is that they're missing uh, valence electrons. So we come back here and see what it says about uh, the electrons. So those electrons in the valence shell are going to have the most potential energy and because they're the first of the nucleus. And those are going to be the electrons that are involved in reactions. So when the atoms react, they're reacting because of the valence shell. So the valence shell are involved in reactions. Now, there's a much easier way to represent the valence shell electrons than having to draw all of the energy levels. Instead, we can draw dot structures. And all that is is just draw the element symbol and then draw uh, the number of dots that are supposed to be in the valence shell. So, uh, you can see here all of these we're just going to draw the symbol and then one dot and the key here is to follow the same pattern we were filling in uh, when we were drawing those uh, electrons in the in the shell in the shells uh, just draw the symbol but you're only going to draw the dots for the valence electrons all these are going to have to do when we come over here to the group seven elements they all have the seven dots and then the noble gases with the exception of helium they have eight, right? So uh, you should practice drawing dot structures and practice uh, reading the periodic table to be able to tell right away how many valence shell electrons there are. So we went back to this one here and I go to a very, very important element, carbon. Carbon is in the first, second, or it's in the fourth row. That means it's gonna have four valence electrons. So we would draw carbon here and again, we follow that pattern, put the electrons as far apart as possible before you start pairing them up, but we don't even need to pair up because we already have our four valence electrons. Okay. Um, if we were gonna draw potassium, which is K over here in the first column, we would draw that dot structure with just one dot there, okay? Uh, so think about this, how would you draw calcium? How many dots if it has two valence in the second column? Uh, how many valence electrons would boron have? Boron is number five, which is over here. Um, how many valence electrons would argon have? And then how would you draw those dot structures? You might want to practice that. Uh, again, only stick to the main block uh, elements, which are the first two columns here and the last six over here. So, um, now we're gonna be looking at uh, something called the octet rule, which means the eight. And here, atoms are gonna be most stable when they have eight valence electrons, like the noble gases. There is the exception, recall that helium doesn't even have eight electrons, it has two, but its innermost shell, that first shell maxes out at two. So helium has a full uh, set at, at two, whereas the other noble gases would have that full valence shell at eight, so you look at the diagram to the right, there's your exception helium, and you're drawing the, the structure with the, with the shell there, it's filled with two. Neon is right below helium in the same column, and there it has a total of uh, 10 protons, so that's 10 electrons, maxing out at two in the middle, and then going and adding the other eight there, and there's your octet. Okay. So, um, this observation appears to be uh, the driving force behind chemical reactions. If you don't have that uh, full set of valence electrons, then you're gonna be uh, reactive. Whereas the noble gases have full valence, they don't react. Uh, so it's uh, the octet rule. And again, the helium is the exception. So these guys are very fairly stable and we're gonna call those the noble gases on the last column of the periodic table. Uh, all of the other elements, as I pointed out, are not gonna have them. And so the way atoms are going to behave is they're going to either gain electrons into their valence shell from other atoms. The other atoms uh, are then going to have to lose those electrons. And on, in some cases, depending on which uh, atoms are reacting, instead they'll share electrons so that they will form that octet uh, in the valence shell. So here are some types of uh, major types of bonds. 
And as far as actual chemical bonds, uh, these are really the only two, the first two. The hydrogen bonding is not actually a chemical bond between the two atoms, and instead, a hydrogen bond is more of a attractive force between separate molecules. So it's technically not a chemical bond, uh, but it's associated with uh, attraction between. So we'll cover the hydrogen bonds at the end. So for now, we're going to look at ionic and chemical bonds, and then we'll get to hydrogen bonds at the end of this section. So we're going to first look at ionic bonds. And the ionic bonds are going to be attractive forces between atoms that have charged particles. And atoms that have charged, uh, or, well, all atoms have charged particles. They have the protons and the electrons. But these, what we're talking about are atoms that have a charge on them. Uh, so we're going to call those atoms that have a charge ions. And in order to get a charge for an atom, before they, uh, any changes take place, an atom is neutral. It has the same number of protons, same number of electrons. So if the atom gains electrons, it's gaining more negative charge, it'll form a negative ion. Okay. Uh, and if it loses, then it'll form a positive ion because it's losing negative charge. So it comes off balance. Now, uh, how a, a, an element and atoms typically behave depends on whether you're a, a metal or a non-metal. Uh, Non-metals tend to have, the ones on the right of the periodic table, tend to have almost a full valence shell, so it's easier for them to gain those electrons, and so they would become negatively charged anions. Whereas the metals, those on the left of the periodic table, or if we went back over here, uh, the ones on the left of the periodic table, like the first two there, they only have, they have one or two in their valence shells, so it's very easy for them to lose them, whereas the non-metals over here, on the right, they have just they just need like one more, so it's very easy for them to gain, right? So what does that what does that mean? The metals tend to lose electrons and become positively charged uh, cations, and the one the metals over here tend to gain and become negative charged uh, anions. Okay, so again. A negatively charged because you gain extra electrons is an anion, and one that becomes positively charged by losing, which usually metals are cations. Okay, so anions are usually going to be the nonmetals, like uh, fluorine or oxygen or nitrogen, and the cations are usually going to be the metals. And when these ions form, then they're oppositely charged, so they attract each other. Uh, and that would be called an ionic bond. So uh, most ionic bonds uh, are going to be referred to, we can refer to them as salts. Um, so uh, they are salts. And when dry, the salts are going to be in crystals uh, instead of individual molecules. So you don't have individual separate molecules like you would a water molecule or carbon dioxide molecule instead. You have one positively charged uh, cation and it attracts several negative anions around it. And then the same is true for each anion, they attract several cations. So there's no real fundamental uh, molecules in there, only uh, a certain ratio of cation to anion. Sodium chloride is an example of that. Now, here's a good question, uh, to re uh, an answer to remember the answer to this question. How can you predict if an ionic bond forms? The answer to that is, that is any time a metal and non-metal react. When a metal and non-metal. So there are anything from the left and the right side of the periodic table, you're going to get an ionic bond. Okay, uh, That's how you can predict when a metal and a non-metal react. So here's an example. Sodium is a metal down on the left side of the periodic table. It's in the first column and has only that one valence electron. And chlorine is on the right side just before the noble gases, and it's in column uh, number seven of the periodic table. And it has seven valence electrons. And so it's easier to lose this one electron, and over here it's easier to just gain one than lose all seven, so the metal tends to pull that valence electron when they react. And so the valence electron leaves the sodium ion and now that leaves one less negative charge. So when that happens, now you're gonna get a positively charged sodium ion, a cation, and that electron that went into the chlorine 
is now right here, and now the chlorine atom has an extra uh, electron, and so that makes it more negative by uh, negative one charge. And so now you have a positive cation and a negative anion, and the two attract forming ionic bond. Now this can actually be represented more easily without having to draw that with a dot structure. Sodium would have one cation, which I suggest you practice from the earlier slide a while ago. And chloride, chlorine, has seven. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So when these react together, this valence electron moves over here. You don't have to worry about the inner shell electrons, just the valence electrons. And now that sodium is missing its valence electron and has a plus one charge, the chlorine has gained an extra electron and now has a full octet. And so it's negatively charged. So if we now look at what we have left, have the two become more stable? Did they get their octet? Yes, they did. Look at sodium now. It's now missing that valence electron, but the next shell underneath has a full octet. So it's become like a noble gas with its octet by forming a positive cation. The chloride has gained that extra electron and now it has an octet. So both have an octet, but both are oppositely charged and they form this stable association uh, of the opposite charges attracting. So if we were to look at a crystal of sodium chloride and it's dry and out of water, uh, this is what the crystal might look like. And if we were to able to see the atoms, uh, and they're not atoms, they're ions, uh, we would see how they're arranged. There's no one separate molecule or separate molecules in there. Instead, you have cations like the chloride attracting several positive sodium ions. These are positive and negative. And then each positive ion is attracting several chloride ions. And so they do so in very specific ratios. In the case of sodium chloride, uh, basically the charges have to balance out for the ions. So this is a plus one and the chloride is a minus one. They're a plus one to minus one. The charges are one to one, so they balance out at a one to one ratio. So we just write the formula Na with no subscript here and Cl with no subscript and then there's your formula for sodium chloride. For covalent bonds, the covalent bonds are going to be formed by sharing uh, two or more valence electrons between atoms. So if two atoms are going to share uh, two electrons or a pair of electrons, that would be a single covalent bond. If they share four valence electrons, then we have a double covalent bond. And if they share six electrons, then we have a triple bond. And uh, the shared electrons are going to allow each atom to have a filled valence shell at least part of the time, and this makes them more stable. So now they're going to react by sharing to do this. Now I asked the question here, how can you predict if a covalent bond forms uh, rather than ionic? Here the answer is uh, you can do this when two nonmetals react. And that's uh, elements from the right side of the periodic table. So going back to the periodic table here, if we have two nonmetals, say nitrogen and oxygen, or carbon and oxygen, or uh, phosphorus and, and uh, chlorine, for example, we can predict that sharing would occur. Okay. Uh, so, uh, taking a look at uh, using dot structures, right? So, if we use dot structures here, and I I draw a dot structure for hydrogen and it's one valence electron. And then I draw another one here, neither one is stable. They're not gonna be stable unless they look like helium and they get two extra electrons. So if we get the two to share, right? If they share their electrons, they share two electrons, a pair of them, then we have a, a hydrogen molecule and that's a covalent bond, a single one. And we can draw that like this. We can re replace the pair of electrons being shared with a dash, and there's your single electron. And we can draw it uh, as a molecular formula of H2. So there you go. Now if we look at oxygen, oxygen is in the sixth column of the periodic table, so each oxygen atom would have a total of six valence electrons. So I'm going to go ahead and draw one, two, three, four, and I'll go back and pair up five, 
and 6. You can see that we have two pairs here, but over here we have a single electron and a single electron, and we're short by uh, two electrons per an octet. So if I were to get another oxygen atom, it's also not stable and we're going to want to react. And it has a similar arrangement. Let's draw mirror images so we can see what's going on here. This uh, single electron right here and this one right here can share. And then the other two single ones can share. Uh, and when they do, these two share, these two share, and you're going to end up getting two pairs of electrons being shared. So one pair being shared, two pairs being shared. And then let's not forget about the unshared pairs. There was an unshared pair here and one here. We're going to go ahead and draw those and try to space them out as evenly as possible. And if we go and we count the dots around each oxygen atom, both are like if they have an octet. This one has one pair right here, two pairs, and then a total of four there. So that's four, five, uh, that's four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's like this atom has a total of eight electrons around it. And this one has a total of eight electrons around it. So both atoms have gotten their octet. And so we can draw uh, those two pairs as two dashes. And then we can draw our unshared pairs of electrons there. And you can still count up the octet around each. Each dash is two electrons. So that's two in the middle, four in the middle all together, and then uh, six, eight. So we have an octet here and an octet here. And mol uh, molecular formula wise, we can do uh, O2. Now, uh, you should try this with nitrogen and see how nitrogen forms uh, will form a triple bond. And so to do that, remember that one nitrogen is going to have, go back to the periodic table, it's in the fifth column, a column right before oxygen. So that means it's going to have five valence electrons. That's one, two, three, four, and then only one paired set. So here we have, we're lacking three electrons to make our octet, and there's uh, three individual electrons. So we get the other nitrogen atom, then this lonely electron can share with the uh, one on the other one, and then the same for this, same for this, and you're going to end up with three pairs or six electrons all together being shared in a triple bond uh, for nitrogen. So the molecule would end up looking like this. And then an unshared pair on either side. And so this can be written as N2, the molecule of nitrogen, but the structural formula is like this, where you have three dashes. Each dash is a pair of electrons. So that's two, four, six, and then eight around there and then two, four, six, eight. So all of them are forming an octet. So if we look at uh, another way, another example of a, a covalent bond using these uh, um, uh, shell drawings, electron shell drawings, we have uh, four hydrogen atoms represented there on the left, uh, right here. And we have one carbon and neither one of them is stable. Hydrogens, the hydrogen need an extra electron they can be have a full shell, and each carbon needs uh, uh, four more valence electrons, or carbon does, to get to eight. And hydrogen is actually on the left side of the periodic table. Now, if we went back to the periodic table, and we kind of just kind of sketching what the periodic table looks like right here. And then we have two columns right here, and then we have six to the outside over here. There's six columns there. Hydrogen is up over here. Earlier I mentioned that hydrogen is kind of unique and kind of weird all on its own. It's got some strange properties. Well, when the hydrogen reacts with non-metals over here, those to the right, remember the noble gases don't react, right? The ones at the very end, but any other non-metal, then the hydrogen is going to behave like a non-metal and that means covalent bonds. So that's something to remember. And so if we took each of these hydrogen atoms and have them share their valence electron with one of the valence uh, electrons of carbon, we're going to get a single covalent bond there, a single covalent bond there, a single one there, and there with no unshared pairs of electrons. And we can draw that structural formula to look like that because each pair would be replaced with a dash. We would be ignoring the inner shell electrons. All we're worried about is whether or not our atoms have full valence electrons. So let's see there. Uh, does carbon have a full octet on its outermost shell? Yes. And then hydrogen only needs two. So each hydrogen atom is going to have like a pair. Uh, the same is true in this, in this uh, structural formula. Each dash represents a pair. So if I just circle around the carbon there, then there's a total of eight valence electrons. 
and then each hydrogen, the dash represents two electrons, so they were going to have a pair of electrons around each one as well. So every one of these atoms has become more stable because they have uh, now a full set of valence electrons like the noble gases. And this shows a different way of showing what I showed you with the oxygen and the way they share a drawing, uh, showing us these uh, 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 electron shell drawings. And what I don't like uh, personally about the drawings that have come in the book is that when they end up drawing the structural formula over here, they've left out uh, the unshared pair of electrons. So uh, the drawing, it looks like there's not a total of eight electrons around each atom, but we would need an unshared pair up over here and then another unshared pair up over here and the same here and here uh, to get that uh, full octet. They're not drawing those unshared pairs. so. Uh, I'll go ahead and draw them in, an unshared pair here and here and here, and then on the other atom, there and there and there. Uh, and then for nitrogen, which is one I told you to consider earlier, uh, they're going to end up sharing a total of um, six electrons, making the triple bond. And again, uh, if you look at the drawing there, the structural formula on the far, far right over here, they left out the unshared pairs of electrons. Uh, so there's some... Uh, technical issues uh, in my estimation on these uh, drawings but that's kind of sort of for a, a general chemistry course and not really not something we're going to focus on too much being um, uh, correct in drawing these structures in our physiology class just as long as you can recognize a triple bond and what it means. Um, there's going to be two types of covalent bonds and this depends on whether or not they share their electrons equally or not. And so um, these two types of bonds include polar and nonpolar covalent bonds. Now for nonpolar covalent bonds, uh, the electrons are going to be shared equally between there. And so uh, the results is that the electrons in the entire molecule uh, that are being shared or the electrons in the bonds are going to be balanced evenly. Uh, and this is going to end up resulting also in nonpolar molecules. Now, they give you carbon dioxide as the example, but I think a much better example would be two atoms that are, are the same kind. Remember, hydrogen has one valence electron, and we put another one, and we have its valence electron, and they share them. Well, both electrons are going to have the same attraction. Their nucleus is going to have the same attraction for those pair of electrons, so those electrons are going to hang out. They're going to spend more time more close to the middle there. And so overall, the charge of the electrons about the nucleus is going to be balanced there. Uh, so this here, if we draw this, then uh, this would be referred to as a nonpolar covalent bond overall. So um, they do draw, they show uh, carbon dioxide as an example of a um, of a nonpolar situation, but they're also confusing or, or adding another concept of symmetry that I haven't covered yet. So again, the ultimate uh, nonpolar covalent bond would be a case where exact equal sharing between two equal uh, atoms, two hydrogen atoms, two oxygen atoms, two nitrogen atoms, for example. Uh, those electrons will spend the exactly the same uh, or be uh, shared about equally there. Now, uh, whether or not we're going to get a polar covalent bond, a bond, uh, this is a different kind of bond, and here the electrons are not going to be shared equally between the two atoms. And what that ends up causing is the, uh, the electrons spend more time closer to one of the atoms that pulls on those electrons a little more strongly. There's a name for that. It's called electronegativity, which is a measure of just how attracted uh, those electrons are to the nucleus of an atom. Now, I did uh, borrow a diagram showing some of the elements in the periodic table. And uh, uh, there's supposed to be decimals there, not commas. And in some uh, locations or places around the world, they use commas instead of a period for a decimal. But so this should be 2.1, which is the value assigned for electronegativity. And you can see that the metals on the left 
have lower electronegativities than the nonmetals over here on the right, except the most electronegative element is fluorine, which means it has the strongest attraction for electrons uh, if two electrons are going to interact with each other. And note that the noble gas in the far right have no value because they're stable. They're not going to be interacting with anybody else's electrons, so their electronegativities are 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 not uh, relevant here. They, 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 there's no measure for them. Uh, so the one strong, the most strongest pulling is fluorine and oxygen, chlorine. Those are very, fairly strong. Nitrogen as well. On the opposite end over here, cesium has some of the lowest. So the lowest ones are over here on the opposite side. And, and again, most of the nonmetals have a very, very low electronegativity. So uh, the type of bond that forms is going to depend on just how different those electronegativities are. The more and more different they are, the more likely uh, the, the highly electronegative atoms like fluorine, oxygen, them are gonna gain electrons from those nonmetals over here that have very low um, electronegativities. Now, the closer they are, then the more likely they are to share, but the sharing is not gonna be as equal as the electronegativities are still relatively different. Now, your book brings up uh, a concept that's kind of similar to this idea here. They use uh, where atoms uh, have a different abilities to attract electrons, and those with greater attraction are more electronegative, and those with less attraction are electropositive. This chart doesn't show electropositivity, it shows electronegativity, the ability to uh, attract electrons. So the book is uh, using a kind of a different term to refer to things like metals that have. Uh, a less electron attracting ability and calling those electropositive. I like the idea of just going with electronegative and then the greater the difference, uh, the less and less equal sharing until eventually a nonmetal steals the electrons from the other atom, which is the case between metals and nonmetals. So uh, if we look at the bond that occurs, for example, between a hydrogen and oxygen and water molecule, if I were to draw uh, start to build a water molecule here on paper. First of all, the oxygen atom, and then you go to the periodic tables in the six column, that means it has six valence electrons. So I'm gonna draw them just the way you've seen them draw a while ago. We space out the electrons, then go back and pair them up. And I draw one pair there, and I draw another pair here, and then two unshared pairs. Okay. So these are the uh, this is an unshared pair, uh, I mean not an unshared, an unpaired, and uh, here's another pair here, and so what we have here is we have an oxygen atom, you know what, let me just redraw this here, I'm having trouble, so let me just redraw it, okay. here's your oxygen atom, four, and then we'll go back and pair up two of them, and that's a total of six electrons. So we have some lonely electrons there that can be shared or from a covalent bond with a hydrogen atom. So if I get a hydrogen atom, one of them, and get its one valence electron and share it right there, we formed a single covalent bond there. Now another hydrogen atom can be shared its valence electron with this one here, and then we have another uh, covalent bond there. So, and then if we replace those with dashes, then we have our typical bent uh, looking molecule, single covalent, single covalent bond, and then we have our unshared pairs of electrons over here. So what I want to do is just focus on one of these bonds right here and point out that if we went back over here to this uh, table that shows the electronegativity differences, oxygen has an electronegativity of 3.5 and hydrogen is 2.1. So they're not the same. And oxygen is going to have a higher electronegativity to pull electrons uh, more strongly, but not so strong that the hydrogen loses them. Uh, that would happen if uh, they've uh, oxygen reacted with a nonmetal, then that would happen, but because the difference is much greater. But here, we're just going to pull a little bit harder so the electrons won't uh, be shared equally. Okay. So if we do that and we just focus on that one bond, and so I'm going to go ahead and draw these here and then we just focus on the first of those hydrogens there then this pair of electrons is actually going to spend more time closer to oxygen and that makes the negative charge off balance overall on the entire molecule 
what that's going to create is this side over here of where the bond is occurring is going to now have a slight positive not a full positive but slight because the negative charges are spending more time over here and if they are then on this side we're going to have a slight negative charge that is what's meant by a polar bond so we have a polar bond here the other bond the second bond that we see right here uh, that single covalent bond is also going to be a polar bond okay so what it creates is is between the two atoms it creates a dipole and a dipole is going to be basically a difference in charge there's two poles there's a slight positive and a negative pole so we have this dipole uh situation forming and this Greek letter sigma is that I drew, it's a, it's a lowercase sigma, is going to be read as partial. So this is partial negative, partial positive, they're not full. The actually are spending more time closer to oxygen. Okay. Um, so that's the idea of a polar covalent bond. And then our water molecule would like, look like this. And so just to finish the drawing, they have this space filled, uh, filled drawing over here. And we see that what happens here is that and again, they didn't draw the unshared electrons, which is semi not sort of not proper. But remember, they had oxygen is more electronegative, as the nonmetals are. On the right side of the periodic table, those electrons have spent more time. So to the oxygen, we get a partial negative over here. This hydrogen will be a partial positive. And then those electrons also we get a partial negative. And then this side partial positive. And what we end up with is not only having polar covalent bonds, but the entire molecule itself is now polar. So there's a partial negative side over here, and over here we have our partial positive sides. So now we have our polar uh, uh, polar molecule because of the polar bond. So um, something to consider, right, is, is uh, uh, that just because you have a polar bond doesn't mean you get a polar molecule. The entire molecule may not be polar itself. So that's something I'm going to come back to again in a little bit. But again, the electronegativities are very, very similar, as is the case when two exact atoms are bonding and their electronegativities are exactly the same. So the electrons spend their time equal time in the middle. If the electronegativities are really close, uh, like uh, if we were to look at hydrogen and carbon, Carbon is 2.5 over here on the right, uh, sort of dark yellow, and then hydrogen is 2.1. The difference between 2.1 and 2.5 is about 0.3 uh, on the terms of electronegativity. So the uh, difference is not so great that uh, we basically, it's a virtually a nonpolar bond. So, and that's something I, I think I would like you to remember as well, is that if we make a, um, a any compound that has carbon and hydrogen, their difference in electronegativities is so little that basically the electrons are going to be roughly shared there. Uh, so uh, when we look at each of these individual bonds in a molecule of methane, which is CH4, each of those single bonds are, are basically going to be more or less uh, nonpolar. Okay, so over here, this is a, a table that does some comparisons. Um, between polar and nonpolar and ionic bonding. This is more of a continuum, and it depends on just how different the electronegativities are from purely covalent between two exact same atoms, all the way to the electronegativities being so different over here on the left that we completely transfer the electrons from one atom to another. Remember the one that receives is the anion, negatively charged, and the one that lost, which is the metal, is the cation. The polar covalent bond, we're just going to have unequal sharing. Uh, and so uh, if we go to the nonpolar column here, the charge will be roughly balanced on the molecule. Here we're going to have a dipole form where we'll have partial positive and partial negative uh, sides uh, of the molecule. And then over here, you have completely separately charged particles, cations and anions. So these are some of the same examples we saw earlier. Let's move on to uh, uh, an idea that's related to whether or not you have polar or nonpolar bonds. So uh, the idea here is that just because you have a, a polar covalent bond does not mean 
that you're going to get a polar molecule. And so the way we can figure that out, and this is something I'm going to expect you to know and apply, is uh, a quick way to determine whether or not an entire molecule is polar or not is to look at its symmetry. If the molecule looks symmetrical to you, about a central, uh, around a, a, a central uh, balancing point on the molecule, then the entire molecule is going to be nonpolar. If it's asymmetrical, the molecule, then it would be polar. So I'll give you an example here. Okay, so let's say we took our methane molecule. And itself here, the, the single covalent bonds aren't even polar, so there's no way the entire molecule can be polar. But if I replaced the carbons, I mean the hydrogens, with chlorine, and chlorine has seven valence electrons, so we would share a pair there, and then there's the unshared pairs here. Okay. And chlorine is very strongly electronegative compared to carbon. Okay. And not strong enough to pull the electrons away because chlorine is a non-metal, so is carbon. But the difference is great enough that we're going to have a polar bond. So, and, and carbon and, and uh, chlorine is more strong. So we went to back to this electronegative activity chart and we looked at chlorine. Chlorine is over here with an electronegativity of 3.0 and carbon is 2.5. So there's a difference that's greater than what we saw last time. The difference is 0.5 now. So now we're getting to our big enough difference where we're going to have unequal sharing. And so we do have polar bonds, okay? So that's going to be one condition. The only way you can have a polar molecule, where is my mark? There it is, okay? is if we have a polar bond. But just because we have polar bonds, and we have four of them here, in every case we have four polar bonds, but so we have dipoles here, here, and here. But going to the symmetry rule, if your molecule looks symmetrical, which means it looks balanced around the central point, then the entire molecule is nonpolar. And if you think about it, these electrons are being pulled towards this chlorine. So we're gonna have an off-balance charge if we just consider these two atoms here. But the same thing is happening over here. These electrons are being pulled to this side of the molecule. And so that off balance on one side is being countered by the off balance on the other side. So basically they cancel each other out. Same thing here and here. So overall, the overall charge on this molecule is balanced and we have a nonpolar molecule, okay? But now, if I were to take our methane molecule again, and replace one of the uh, hydrogens with the chlorine. And then we go back to the center of the molecule and then determine, does it look balanced or symmetrical on all parts of the molecule? And the answer is no. If it were balanced, we would have a chlorine on the other side and we don't. So overall, if I draw the, the uh, polar bond between the dipole with this arrow here, in the case of dipole, we're, we're gonna have more negative charge on this side we're going to have less negative charge or slightly positive charge on this side. So overall, now we get a polar molecule. Why? Because the molecule is not symmetrical, it's asymmetrical, okay? So now this comes back to the water molecule. If the water molecule was not bent, I keep losing where my marking point is. Okay, so if the water molecule was not bent, and so it's H2O, and our water molecule look like this instead, and it was linear. And the hydrogen and the oxygen really likes the electrons a lot more, so we get our two individual unequal sharings. Okay, most of the electrons, the electrons spend more of their time around the middle of the molecule, and overall the molecule looks symmetrical, so it would be nonpolar. But that's not the case. Water is bent, and because water is bent molecule, those electrons now spend more time closer to the other side of the molecule over here, slight negative on this side, and we have our slight positives on this side, and it's asymmetrical. If my center of the molecule, the center of uh, where I see it is around right here, okay, and then I look for symmetry. If I cut it right down the middle here, yeah, it looks like a mirror image on each side, but if I cut it here, no mirror image there. It's asymmetrical, it's gonna be a polar molecule. So that's kind of the idea here. First of all, if you're going to get a polar molecule, you better have polar bonds. But the second condition is that we're asymmetrical. If you're not asymmetrical, then you're not going to be 
uh, you're not going to be polar. Okay, so water happens to be polar. I'm going to have to erase all this because I'm about to have some text come up. So, there we go. That's marking here. So, something to remember and be able to apply. And I do have questions on quizzes and tests that uh, cover the symmetry rule for the entire molecule. So, now if we look at water molecule, and we see that we have individual water molecules that are polar, and they have slight positive and slight negatives to each other uh, um, on each side of the molecule, then those slight positive and negatives are going to attract, be attracting to the other slight positive or negatives of other water molecules. And that's where we get into a situation of attractive forces. They're not really chemical bonds. They're just sort of this... Uh, uh, attraction between molecules. This is a weak attraction, but it's called a hydrogen bond. So not really a chemical bond. So the attractive force is going to be between the, uh, we go back to the water molecule and draw another one here. The water molecule is going to have a slight negative side and then your slight positive sides. So the slight positive side of the molecule would attract the slight negative side of another water molecule. And when we do that, as we see in the drawings here, we're going to draw those slight attractive forces, these little dashed lines. Those little dashed lines represent our hydrogen bonds, okay? Uh, so it's not a true chemical bond. It's more kind of like, uh, it's analogous. It's not the same as uh, a magnetic attraction, but it's really uh, attractive between the negative and positive uh, electric fields that are associated with these charged particles. Uh, now, uh, this hydrogen bond is going to be common between dipoles uh, such as water. Remember, water has this overall dipole to it. It's got a uh, slight negative and slight positive uh, side to it. And, and the, the really interesting thing about this is that water is such a small molecule. Any molecule that is about the size of water would be a gas at room temperature. It's too small. There's no gravity. There's, no, there's not enough mass, not enough attractive force between the particles. They're so small. It's something the size of a water molecule, which weighs all together. If we were to add up the two hydrogens that are one atomic mass unit and the one oxygen is about 16, it's a total of 18 atomic mass units. There are molecules that are even heavier than this that would be a gas at room temperature. You have to be a very heavy molecule uh, to be a liquid at the temperature we're used to. Uh, but uh, what keeps water together room temperature is that the water molecule is asymmetrical and it's polar. So the slight positive, slight negatives attract uh, are attract the water molecules to each other with these hydrogen bonds and, uh, and that keeps it uh, liquid at room temperature. So um, that's, that's fairly interesting. Now, uh, the hydrogen bonding though, uh, if we look at uh, a diagram that I've drawn here on the right, the water molecules are, are close and they're sliding past each other. And as the water molecules are moving around in liquid water, they're making and breaking these hydrogen bonds uh, as they're moving past each other. And so it's kind of like uh, they're social, right? They're going there's uh, like social people going in uh, to a crowd and shaking hands. It takes a while to shake hands, and then you gotta let go of the handshake and you move on. That's like kind of uh, uh, a way to think about it. And they're, so they're going to be sliding past each other, but making and breaking these hydrogen bonds. And those hydrogen bonds are strong enough to keep these water molecules light as they are together at room temperature. And the interesting thing about this is that when water freezes, and this is the picture on the left over here, the water molecules actually freeze into position. And because of their bent shape, they end up uh, moving farther apart from each other. So the volume of that mass of water increases, and that's what makes ice less dense at freezing, when the water molecules freeze. This is the only substance known to do that. Almost anything else, when you freeze it, uh, particles contract tighter and tighter. So the, the substance gets denser and denser, but water gets less dense. In fact, if you've ever made the mistake of putting a glass container with water in the freezer, you'll know why the ice, why the, why the, the glass broke, because the water expanded as it froze in the, uh, in the, in the glass there. So, these hydrogen bonding is very important. Uh, and the diagram on the left shows uh, just uh, five water molecules and showing these uh, hydrogen bonds. And you see the way it works there. The slightly negative uh, 
uh, side of the oxygen atom, it's going to be attracted to the slightly positive charge on the hydrogen atoms. And so the same is true, the slight opposite charges attract each other. And in liquid, these bonds are transient, they're temporary as the water molecules are sliding past each other. But overall, at any given point in time, in a body of water, there's a whole bunch of hydrogen bonds uh, um, working at the same time, whereas a whole bunch are breaking at the same time. Overall, that's enough to create uh, a force on the, within the water um, that requires energy to break. And you can see this insect on the right, this insect called a water strider here on the right, taking advantage of those forces. It turns out the water at the surface is gonna form this tension because the water molecules are all attracted to each other, wanna to stay together. That uh, tension on the surface is called a, a surface tension. And so the water strider with its big enough feet is able to walk on that force, on, the, on that surface tension force uh, on there. And so that's a kind of interesting um, idea of the surface tension. So the most important determinant of an atom's bonding behavior is, is it A, the number of protons in the nucleus, B, the total number of electrons, C, the number of valence shell electrons, or D, the number of neutrons in the nucleus, which is the most important for determining behavior um, of an atom. Number, the next uh, uh, sample question is, when atoms gain electrons, is it A, the atoms become electrically neutral, B, the atom becomes positively charged, or C, their atomic mass significantly increases, or D, the atoms become negatively charged. Next question, ionic bonds connect atoms together by, is it A, overlapping of valence electrons, is it B, charge attractions, is it C, overlap of the nucleus, or D, attractions between dipoles. Next possible or uh, sample question is that water, H2O is a polar molecule, oxygen is electronegative and hydrogen is less electronegative or as your book calls it electropositive. This means that is it A, each hydrogen pulls electrons away from the oxygen and becomes more negative, B, the electrons are shared equally, C, Oxygen pulls electrons away from hydrogen and becomes more negative, or D, uh, oxygen pulls electrons away from hydrogen and becomes more positive. So which answer do you feel is correct? In section five, we're gonna be looking at chemical reactions and our learning outcomes are gonna to be to define the three major types of chemical reactions. They include synthesis, decomposition, and exchange discuss the nature of uh, oxidation reduction reactions and their importance, and explain why chemical reactions in the body are often uh, irreversible, which means they can't go backwards. We can't uh, uh, go back and make reactants, and then describe uh, factors that affect how fast chemical reactions occur, the rates of chemical reactions. So um, looking at a section called chemical equations, which we're gonna to use to represent reactions. So what are those chemical reactions? These are gonna occur when chemical bonds are formed, rearranged, or broken. These reactions can be written uh, symbolically, and that symbolic representation of the chemical rea uh, uh, reactions are called chemical equations. In our chemical uh, uh, equation, we're going to have a reactants and the reactants are going to interact with each other and rearrange their, their chemical bonds to produce products. So the products come after the arrow. And the arrow can be read as yields or produces. Okay. Now, um, so those are the reactants uh, which go through the reaction and then the products, which is what you get when we're done with the reaction. Now the amounts of the reaction and products have to be balanced in our equation. So if I were to look at, a, at a, a, a reaction in which molecular hydrogen and molecular oxygen react to form water, we can't create or destroy atoms during a regular chemical reaction, which it's the law of conservation of matter. And so if we look, we have two atoms of hydrogen bonded together, two atoms of oxygen bonded together, and then we get water, which is H2O, we're missing 
an oxygen and you cannot change the subscript because the subscript gives you uh, the subscripts are important in telling us what we have but if I put H2O2 here uh, like this then we don't have water anymore we have something else and so since we make water the way we're going to make sure we didn't create or destroy any uh, atoms here is to use coefficients so I'm going to look at putting a number in front of here to tell me how many of each molecule we have so the way I can get two oxygens to balance uh, the reactants with the products is to put a coefficient of two here because if I have two water molecules I'll end up with uh, each one has one oxygen that will give me a total of of two oxygens uh, but now I'm going to have a total of four hydrogens because two water molecules each has two Hydrogen is two times two is four, so the way I'm going to solve that is come over here and put a two in front of there. So now we're balanced all together. Total of four hydrogens, four hydrogens on the left and right, and then uh, right here we have a total of just two oxygens, and then since two water molecules, we get two oxygens. So we're balanced all the way through, and so that's what's meant by making sure we're balancing our products and reactants uh, in there. Compounds are going to be represented with molecular formulas. So molecular formulas are different than what we've seen before. For example, methane right here is, is the molecular formula for this substance, but its structural formula shows us the arrangement of the atoms in the molecule. So that would be the same as CH4 water. We drew water in the last section would be a bent molecule. Uh, and we saw that it's actually a polar molecule because it's asymmetrical. Methane is not polar because it's uh, uh, symmetrical, but I'm already I'm, I'm starting to talk about a prior uh, uh, concept that we, we talked about. Uh, methane is symmetrical, so it's nonpolar. Uh, the subscripts in these formulas, as a, it's a, a shorthand way of doing it, are going to indicate the types of atoms that are joined by the bonds. And so in a chemical equation, the subscripts indicate how many atoms are joined by bonds, whereas the coefficients are going to say how many of each of those molecules we have, or another way of saying this, a molecule is considered a particle. Uh, so it tells us how many atoms or how many uh, molecules we have. So here uh, we might have two hydrogen atoms. Uh, which are unstable would react to yield or give us uh, molecular hydrogen here. Uh, four hydrogens and one carbon give us uh, methane here. And uh, technically this is sort of incorrect because hydrogen is never by itself, so it would be H2 uh, plus carbon to yield uh, methane. And then if we wanted to balance, we'd go with the coefficients trial and error. The carbons are balanced overall, but we would need to put a coefficient of two in front of there and that would balance our equation. So now we're going to look at types of chemical reactions. There's three types uh, that were mentioned in the objectives. We have a synthesis reaction is the first one we're going to look at. And here, uh, you're basically going to be starting with uh, smaller particles, molecules or atoms, and build larger ones. And sometimes they refer to the synthesis as anabolic in your living system. So uh, anab anabolic uh, process or metabolism are going to be things that build larger molecules. So we can represent that simply by saying reactant A and reactant B or A and B uh, react with each other to yield AB, something bigger. On the right over here, we see an example here showing smaller particles being bonded into larger, larger, more complex molecules. An example here would be amino acids being joined together to make large protein molecules. So here are individual amino acids and then they join and to link long, uh, into longer chains uh, to form our protein molecules. That would be a synthesis uh, uh, chemical reaction. And then we have the opposite here, uh, a process called decomposition. And here we're going to break down larger molecules uh, into uh, smaller molecules. And basically this is the reverse of synthesis reactions. And while synthesis is called anabolic, decomposition is called catabolic reactions or or catabolism and the equation given here is incorrect it's the opposite this was the equation for synthesis so instead you start with something bigger and then in decomposition you break it into smaller uh, smaller parts so an example here we go from a more complex larger molecule to something less complex and here uh, animals including humans are going to store sugar 
simple sugars as large molecules, complex molecules called glycogen. Plants store the, the same sugar as starch. So it's just a different way of bonding the sugar molecules. And so if we're gonna use those sugar molecules, we need to decompose the glycogen into the basic glucose molecules. So here you have your larger glycogen molecule. And then if we break down uh, to the simple glucose molecules, now the cells can use those for energy. So that would be a catabolic or decomposition reaction. And then we have exchange reactions. Sometimes these are called displacement reactions. So that's another, another name we can use uh, for these here. Uh, and here, uh, they involve both synthesis and decomposition. So we break down, uh, we might break down some larger molecule and then take a piece of it and move it to another molecule. So we're kind of exchanging or displacing uh, items. So uh, bonds are gonna be both made and broken. And an example here, this would be a single uh, displacement reaction. And here you can see that A was initially in the reactant attached to B and uh, reactant AB is gonna react with C and then we get our products A, C, and B. So it seems that the A and the B uh, 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 were exchanged. Okay, so we exchanged places and now C is combined with A. And then over here, this one shows a double uh, displacement or double exchange reaction. And here, the B and the D and the reactants uh, are gonna switch places with each other in our products. So that would be a double displacement there. Uh, so AB reacts with CD, and then our products are going to be AD plus CB. Uh, so uh, our exchange reaction uh, can be uh, an example given here where, where uh, we have a molecule of adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, and ATP is going to have three phosphates, the, the triphosphate there. So this is our overall larger ATP molecule is gonna react with glucose sugar molecule. And what's gonna happen here is this ener energy molecule basically transfers uh, its phosphate onto another molecule, priming that molecule to do stuff. So ATP is our energy source molecule. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna unload that glucose uh, with some potential energy by moving that phosphate on there. So basically we're doing a single exchange here. So you can see our products here now are gonna be adenosine diphosphate. It no longer has the phosphate on there and the phosphate is now attached to the glucose molecule. So now we have glucose phosphate as a product. So that would be, in this case, this is an example, uh, general example of a of this uh, single displacement reaction. And then we have, uh, all chemical reactions can be classified as uh, reduction oxidation reactions or oxidation reduction reactions. Uh, and for short, we'll say redox reactions. And here, uh, when chemical reactions are taking place, the valence electrons are interacting with each other and electrons uh, tend to move from one uh, group of atoms to another. And so that process of those electrons moving you have energy changes taking place within the molecules. And so uh, any atoms that uh, receive or gain electrons are gonna be called, uh, they're gonna be said to be reduced. So those that gain electrons are reduced and anything that loses an electron is gonna be oxidized. So oxidized would lose electrons. Now the example given here in the notes is not very clear because you, these are molecular compounds. You cannot see the uh, the electrons being transferred here, but I'll tell you a, a, a little trick uh, to help you recognize what oxidize and reduce. Just follow the hydrogens. The electrons are often moving with the hydrogens. And here we have a high energy molecule that our cells use called glucose. And then we need oxygen to help break down that glucose. The oxygen helps us release the energy from our glucose molecule. So what we should do is follow where the hydrogens are going. This is a hydrogen rich molecule reacting with oxygen. Where did the oxygens go? The oxygens went, I mean the hydrogens, the hydrogens which are carrying the electrons are actually going onto the oxygen molecule. So now we end up creating water in this reaction and the hydrogens went there. So uh, which one, where did the, uh, the uh, electrons go? The electrons went with the hydrogens onto the oxygen, right? So uh, here, what we're doing is we're reducing the oxygen because the electrons are going 
oxygen. That means the food molecule, which is losing those electrons, is being reduced, and the result is carbon dioxide. So in the case where organic molecules are going through redox reactions, I would say follow the hydrogens because the hydrogens are carrying the electrons with them. And the hydrogens carry the electrons with them. Now, if we want to uh, understand oxidation reduction reactions, we might follow instead the formation of ionic bond because we can see the uh, uh, valence electrons moving. So let's react a metal with a non-metal, which we know will give an ionic compound. And uh, sodium with its one valence electron, it's in the first column of the periodic table, reacts with chlorine atom, which has in the seventh column of the periodic table, so it'll have seven valence electrons. And when they react, this electron is going to move into the valence shell of chlorine. And so that creates a sodium ion and a chloride ion. And the reason the sodium is a cation and positively charged is because it lost one of its negative charges. So it's no longer balanced and it's off as a one extra positive charge. And remember during uh, this ionic bond formation, this positively charged cation that's right here is going to be attracted to this negative charge to form the ionic bond. Chlorine, uh, the chloride ion actually has an extra negative charge, so now it's a negative charge. But we can see that the one of these species, the sodium, is losing the electron and the chloride is gaining the electron. So that means then that sodium since it lost its electron is oxidized based on the definition given right above and the chlorine then is reduced and so remember that that when you gain the electron you're reduced when you lose it you're oxidized so uh, that's the thing. a couple of other terms here if we look at what's causing well the chloride really loves to pull the electrons away from metals so it's causing the sodium to become oxidized. So it's the chlorine then that we can call the oxidizing agent or the oxidizer. So which is the oxidizer? It's the chlorine because the chlorine causes the oxidation of the other. If this is the oxidizer, then sodium, which gives up electron very easily, the chlorine is the opposite. It's the reducer because it causes a reduction of the other species, in this case, chlorine. So it's the reducing agent. So the reducing agent. So um, during these chemical reactions, the energy uh, does move, uh, move about, and uh, uh, it, it's either going to come into your reaction system or leave the reaction system then in case it may give off light or heat or both. And so in cases where uh, energy flow is occurring to these reactions. If energy flows out of the system, then it would be extragonic. Uh, so what happens here is during the reaction, uh, energy is given off. It can be given off as heat, light, uh, or even sound in some cases. Uh, so basically, exer is like exit. We're going to release energy from there. And here, the products uh, at the end are going to have less potential energy because the energy was given off uh, from the system. And uh, so the products are going to have less potential energy during exergonic. And these are usually related to catabolic reactions. Anytime you take a bigger molecule and you break it down, you're going to be releasing uh, energy. Which is why we, we take food in. We take food in like a, a slice of bread and eat it. It's got real complex carbohydrate, large, large sugar molecules that we break down to release the reaction. Uh, and then we have uh, exer, uh, endergonic, and ender is like endo, which means to move in. And uh, these reactions require energy input. So there's gonna be a net absorption of energy. Uh, so you're basically gonna be using up energy. So this situation requires energy to happen. And when that occurs, the products are gonna have more potential energy now than the reactants. So these would be anabolic reactions, reactions of building. So 
we can see an analogy here. If you're going to construct a building, you have to put energy and materials into building it, right? But if the building is not made carefully and uh, the support structure in there is not uh, placed in correctly, the building could fall down and break apart. And if it falls down and breaks apart, it's going to release a lot of heat and sound energy. So breaking down is uh, extragonic. Building up requires energy input. So catabolic releases, exergonic, right? And endergonic requires energy input, and those are anabolic reactions. And then we have reversibility of chemical reactions. So some uh, chemical reactions uh, are reversible, and we'll see those in our study of physiology. And theoretically, all of them are reversible. Um, but the problem is, in most reactions uh, in our system, most biological reactions, they're not very reversible. This is because, um, uh, in a lot of cases, the the products have less potential energy, uh, and so in order to move backwards, we would have to input. Uh, we have to we would have to put in some energy to do it. An example here is when we take uh, a glucose molecule and oxidize it to uh, gain energy, and our cells do this to produce ATP, you end up getting water and carbon dioxide. And these two products have lower potential energy than what we started. The glucose molecule had a lot of potential energy in the chemical bonds. And so let me balance this real quick here. Uh, and so overall, we have less energy here because energy is given off. Over here, we have more energy more potential energy. So we could reverse this theoretically, but it's going to require a lot of energy input. So it's not likely to happen, although it's theoretically possible. In fact, plants are able to do the reverse reaction. Plants will take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and with water, but they use the energy from the sun in a process called photosynthesis. So plants are capable of doing this to produce their own food. Uh, but when you break down the food, it's not likely to happen to reverse on its own just spontaneously. You need the metabolic machinery that plants have and the help of sun energy to do this. Uh, and then we have another situation here in, uh, in solution chemistry. And oftentimes within your cells, reactions are occurring where uh, we have an equilibrium situation. And in this case here, um, for equilibrium, you might have a, a, a situation where you have some reactants occurring, uh, going through a reaction and they go this way. The reaction uh, proceeds to the right and then you get some new products. And a small amount of these reactants go back the other way. And so uh, it does so until there is a certain balance between the reactants and the products. And this is called chemical equilibrium. And we'll see some of this later when we talk about how carbon dioxide is transported in the blood. We're going to see uh, that we have neither a forward or a reverse reaction. So it's not like this one. So I think this slide notes kind of confuses two different concepts. Chemical equilibrium is something a bit different than just reversing a reaction. In this case, the nature of your solution uh, uh, has these reactions products that are constantly moving back and forth until they get to some sort of balance between the, the uh, those uh, uh, the molecules on the left and the ones on the right. And so that's uh, chemical equilibrium. Uh, now the speed of the chemical reactions can be affected by several factors. If you increase temperature, you're going to increase the speed of, of the particles. They move faster, so more collisions is going to mean higher reaction rates, faster the reaction. So that's why Sometimes in chemistry labs, we heat up uh, stuff so that the reactions go faster. Also, the concentration of the reactants. If you put more reactants together, then there's going to be more collisions, more opportunities for the reactions to occur. The particles that are reacting with each other have to run into each other in order to react. And then finally, particle size. Smaller particles are going to react faster. And that's simply true because at the same temperature, uh, by the way, temperature itself, what is it? And temperature is going to be a measure of the average kinetic energy uh, of the substance that you are uh, trying to uh, measure the temperature for. So if 
Uh, you have two different substances, say two different liquids or gases, and, and those two different substances have different size molecules, then at the same temperature, the smaller molecules are going to be moving faster. They have to because remember that temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy. When I put a bar above a, a quantity, then that means average. So the average kinetic energy is actually related uh, or proportional to both the mass and uh, uh, the velocity squared. So if the mass goes up or the velocity goes up, you get a higher kinetic energy. So if mass is bigger, then the particles would be moving slower at the same temperature than smaller particles uh, would be. Uh, a great analogy here or, or a way to think about this is if you look at a large bus and a car, both the bus and the car uh, have to be moving to have kinetic energy, but in order for the car to have the same amount of kinetic energy as the bus, the car would have to be moving faster in order to do that. So again, if you're at the same temperature with two different substances, in order for them to have the same temperature, then the larger particles should be moving slower on average and the smaller particles would be moving faster so that they both have the same temperature and same average kinetic energy. So now we're going to look at the rate of uh, chemical reaction, and this is going to be the speed of uh, how chemical reactions progress, how fast the reaction occurs. And the speed or the rate can be affected by three factors, temperature, uh, the concentration of the reactants and particle size. When temperature increases, the average uh, uh, speed and kinetic energy of the particles increases. So there's going to be more collisions between the particles with greater force and that uh, increases uh, the chances that reactions will occur between particles. So that overall increases the speed of the reaction. Now, if you have a higher concentration of reactants, then there's going to be more collisions. It's just more crowded uh, within, the, uh, within the reaction. So uh, the increase in uh, reactions also increases the rate. And then particle size. Here, there's sort of a, um, an opposite uh, or inverse relationship here in that smaller particles would increase the reaction rate. So, uh, and the reason for that is that at the same temperature, smaller particles are moving faster because temperature is a, it's basically a measure of the average kinetic energy uh, in, a, in a substance. And so uh, at the same temperature, a substance with larger molecules would be moving slower on average than a substance that's at the same temperature with smaller molecules. The smaller molecules would have to be moving faster to have the same average kinetic energy. Uh, so the, the uh, a, a, a physical example that we might be able to connect more to is uh, a bus and a car. Uh, both a moving bus and a car have the ability to do work if they hit something or push on something, but uh, uh, how much kinetic energy each one has depends on their speed, not just their mass. The bus is more massive. So can a car have the same kinetic energy as a bus? The answer would be yes, but the car has to be moving faster than the bus in order to have the same kinetic energy. Uh, so now we look at another uh, a factor here, and that's uh, a catalyst. And a catalyst in general uh, is uh, a catalyst increases the rate of a reaction without being chemically changed or becoming part of the product. And as an example, if I were to get a, a pure piece of iron, and iron rusts, it reacts with oxygen in the atmosphere and will rust. And if I get a, a piece of iron and I expose it to water, it'll rust a lot faster. So the water acts as a catalyst. The water doesn't become part of the reaction. It doesn't get used up in the reaction to form something else, but the water allows the oxygen and the iron to react faster. Uh, if you took a similar piece of iron and went and put it out in a very dry desert, it would take a lot longer to rust. But if you put that piece of iron in a humid or wet environment, it will rust. So the, the water serves as a catalyst for the reaction. Now in your, in your cells, uh, we have biological catalysts called enzymes, and they help speed up reaction at our normal body temperature. So uh, the way we're going to regulate and, and increase the chance of reaction occurring is to produce proteins called enzymes that serve as those catalysts. 
enzymes will be explored a little bit further in part two of this chapter. So now looking at an example question uh, from the material we just covered in this section, uh, in a chemical reaction blank, a joint to form blank. And so is the answer here A, products, uh, and then reactants, or is it B, molecules, and then atoms? Is it C, formulas, and then products, or is it D, reactants, and then products? Next sample question or example question will be, what will be the effect on a chemical reaction if the concentration of the reactants is increased? Uh, is it A, the speed of the reaction will slow, B, the speed of the reaction will increase, C, the speed of the reaction will remain unchanged, or D, the reaction will not require a catalyst. And then there's your periodic table. Make sure you uh, look over the periodic table. You don't memorize it, just make sure you understand uh, how to interpret it. The columns are families, and any element within a column will have very similar uh, chemical and physical properties. And then each row represents the period. And that's because as you read the periodic table from uh, left to right, and you move down to the next uh, uh, row, you're going to see a repeat in the pattern of properties. At the very end, you're going to have the noble gases all the time that are not react uh, very reactive because they have full valence shells. And then when you come to the first element on the next row, you have very reactive metals that have only one valence electron. Uh, and then you keep going, and as you get to the second to the last column, uh, column number seven or number 17, uh, they're called the halogens. They all have seven valence electrons, and they're very, very reactive nonmetals. So it is a repeating pattern with every row, and that's why it's called a periodic table.